Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Apologies again for the delay. So, uh, day two. We're done with day one. We're starting our day two. Just a reminder, day one, most of what we talked about was at the zeroth level. The terminology we are using is on the wafer is at the zeroth level. And uh, I said today we'll start with level one, interconnecting at level one, right? So that's where we're going to start out. And again, by way of continuity, uh, here's the terminology we had set up. Zeroth level is on chip. We talked about that yesterday. And uh, which reminds me, just a quick correction. There was an error in the RC delay model yesterday. So uh, fourth day, I have a whole session on circuit, simple circuit lump parameter models. We'll come back to that at the time. Okay. Okay, so today we are at first level. And I will do BGA this afternoon. That way your thermal session will be easier tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> so let's start out with uh, some of the classical level one packaging configurations. The first thing to do, and because this is a course that we normally teach to both undergraduate and graduate students in mechanical engineering in my college, uh, they have no prior knowledge of the terminology used in electronic packaging world. So I'll go through some of that. So this section is just the terminology, some common package architecture names, because we keep throwing those acronyms around. And for someone who's not used to it, uh, what's all this, <laughs> right? So just to put everyone on the same page here, we'll go through some of the taxonomy. And uh, afternoon, uh, part of the afternoon will still be on level one, and then I'll move on to level two somewhere in the middle of the afternoon. Okay. okay. <coughs> so let's start way back, 1960s, 50s, 60s, the earliest transistor packages. We've all seen packages like, well, I don't know if you folks have. I have. I've seen transistor packages like these uh, TO cans. Okay, uh, very simple architecture. Uh, chip is inside, and then a hermetically sealed metal can. And uh, the leads come out, the three leads, uh, source, drain, and gate will come out. And uh, usually it's a through hole interconnection. So these pins would go inside, uh, plated through holes in circuit cards, and then you would solder it in place. And that would be your uh, uh, in interconnection to the board. Uh, things have, and this is just the inside of it. So these are basically cavity packages. So there's a metal uh, lid, substrate, uh, die attach, and the die is face up on it. It's wire bonded. We'll be talking a lot more about this today. Uh, what's a die attach? What kind of materials they use for die attach? What's, uh, how do people do uh, wire bonding? So that's all level two interconnection, and we'll be talking about that today. Okay, I'm sorry, level one, uh, one interconnection. We'll talk about all that today. Okay, so. Um, Today's components look quite a bit different, okay, not quite the same. Even there, there's a broad classification between sealed hermetic can, uh, pa packages versus plastic molded packages. The plastic molded are not uh, hermetic, meaning moisture eventually uh, absorbs through the plastic and gets to the uh, circuitry inside. Uh, but the hermetic uh, packages are completely moisture proof. The leakage rates have to be extremely small in hermetic packages. And for very high rel applications like uh, uh, military electronics and so on, they still, some applications still require hermetic packages. But the percentage of hermetic packages now is very, very small compared to uh, the plastic packages. Uh, and hermetic packages come in two incarnations. There's either the metal can hermetic packages or uh, ceramic uh, case hermetic packages. And the concept is very simple. You've got a case or a substrate, and then you've got a lid. So these have all been de-lidded, so you can see the inside. There's no electronics in there. The, electron the dies are all going to go. These are empty cans. The dies will all be bonded down with die attach in here. Sometimes it's a multi-chip module. There'll be multiple dies with other associated uh, passive circuitry in there. And then the uh, interconnections are through these sealed leads. And uh, so there are portholes for the leads with glass frit seal. And then the leads come outside. You interconnect them to the inside. And then you can connect the outside to, uh, to the outside world. Uh, the, after you've put the electronics down, you then have to seal this. And usually it's a glass frit material or a kovar material that will be used for sealing. Or uh, some, it oftentimes also a, a, what we call a hard solder. It's a gold tin eutectic solder. But it's called a hard, hard solder as opposed to tin based, uh, tin lead based solder. It's, uh, it has extremely high, gold tin solders have extremely high melt temperatures compared to regular solder. 
So, uh, <clears throat> so that's the overall bifurcation. And uh, we'll spend most of the time today talking about this configuration that's commonly what's available uh, in commercial world. And I intentionally didn't spend much time on this architecture here. We'll have plenty of slides to talk about that later on. OK, okay so here is, uh, let's look at the ceramic cases just very briefly, and then we'll uh, move on to the plastics. So the way these start is basically these have uh, metal lead frames. Okay. So uh, these cases really, uh, this, these, these actually lead less versions. Okay. But the, if the, it's a leaded version, then there'll be a lead frame. So there'll be pre-stamped uh, sheets or ribbons, really, of these kinds of lead frames. So there'll be long ribbons with many such. So think about this lead frame before it has been bent. The bending operation is done later. It comes out in flat configuration initially. So these are stamped and made out of uh, long, narrow ribbons. And uh, it's basically roll-to-roll -roll kind of a operation. They stamp these, and you have these ribbons with many such uh, flat lead frames side by side. And then you'll singulate these into individual lead frames. Then you'll bend the leads down, and then it looks like what you're seeing over here. And the lead frame basically consists of the central metal portion where the die is going to sit. The chip is so this is a single chip package. And uh, uh, it's often called the die paddle. The purpose of that metal is to remove the heat from the die and get it out through the leads and to the case. Uh, and the f so the first step is you put the base on. So again, this is a ceramic package, so it's alumina, okay, alumina base. Uh, so you uh, attach the base, then you attach the chip with, so there's the die with a die attach, okay, so you mount the chip on that. Uh, you interconnect the chip with wire bonds to the leads each. I.O. on the die is bonded to each I.O. on the lead frame. So uh, if I zoom in here, and I was just told this is a touch screen, except it doesn't respond to my touch. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, try it again. Nope. So if you zoom in, you can see there are uh, wire bonds going from the I.O.s on the die surface. So th this die is face up. The, all the metallization active surfaces on the upper side. Uh, and the wire bonds go from the bond pads on the die to individual lead frames. And now you can attach the lead frames to your circuit card and you have connectivity. Okay. So, uh, so after the interconnection, now it's time to close up that package. The die has been mounted, it's been interconnected. Now you have to uh, uh, close up that package. So you need a lid. So the lid is also ceramic, alumina. And uh, you have to seal up the opening between the lid and the base. And you usually use a glass frit to do that. And we'll talk more about what's glass frit later on. But that fills in all the gaps. And then you have to uh, finish it at high temperature. Uh, the frit has to be baked at high temperature. And that completes the packaging. So that's very, very simple, simplified view, schematic of what the pro uh, processes are in that. And here are some configurations. So the one we just saw is something like this, closed, but not quite. This one is a little bit different in the sense the lid is only over part of the case. So the case in this case comes with uh, a cavity in there, and you place the die in that cavity, and then you seal it up over there. So that's what, uh, typically what's called a dual inline package, dip, because there are two rows of IOs, right? So in this case, it's a C dip. Similarly, there are plastic dips. That would be P dips. We'll see that later on. Uh, these are, uh, so these are called dual packages because there are two si uh, li uh, IOs on two sides. Similarly, we'll see there's also a single uh, inline configuration where there's only one row of leads. We'll see that soon. And then there are the quad packs. So quad meaning the leads on all four perimeters. So this is still what we call a peripheral lead. That means all the IOs are along the perimeter of the package. But it's a quad because it's four-sided. But it has no leads. It's lead less. So these leads, uh, leads are not there. Instead, they're bond pads, bonding pads like these on the bottom. And those are soldered directly onto bond pads of the circuit card. So there are absolutely no leads there. And that has tremendous configurations, now, about tremendous implications. I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, why do you think you need leads to begin with? Why not have all of them this way? There are multiple reasons why you need leads. The most obvious geometric one would be 
in the old days, circuit cards were through hole. How are you going to mount this in a through hole package? You can't, right? So you need leads that go through the holes, matching holes in the circuit card, and then you'd solder it in. These are what we call surface mount packages. So these are soldered onto pads on the surface of the PWB. There are no holes in the PWB in this case. There are pads on the surface, matching pads on the surface. And this would sit on that matching pad. The, these pads would sit on those matching pads. Well, the, the corresponding pads on the bottom side would sit on the pads in the circuit card. And then you would solder them in place. <coughs> these are uh, ceramic flat packs. Usually, the leads are bent on these, and then they're mounted onto circuit cards. It can be bent in two configurations. Well, multiple configurations. It can be bent into configurations that are meant for surface mount. And there are two versions, a J-lead and a gullwing lead. We'll talk about that. Or you could just bend them straight down and put them th in through hole uh, configuration. And then, th so both of these are what we would call quad packs, because they're, they're perimeter IOs on all four sides. Okay? This one is a little bit different. You can't see the bottom, but if you think about the leads being on the underside of each of these IO circles shown over here, then clearly you've got more than uh, perimeter leads. You've got leads also somewhere in the middle of the package. So that was what we would call an area array package, because the leads are distributed in two-dimensional arrays uh, over the entire area of the package. So that would be an area array package. If these are leads coming out of there, then we call them a pin grade array. If there are no leads, then it's a leadless grade array. And leadless grade arrays are usually soldered down uh, with solder balls. So they're called ball grade arrays. Sometimes also land grade arrays, if it's not a ball but a very flat solder joint, it's a land grade array or a pad grade array. Okay? So we'll talk about uh, several of those configurations. And uh, those we'll talk about in the afternoon before your session tomorrow. OK, so bottom line, you can have single inline, which I haven't shown on this page. I'll show it later. Dual inline, quad, area array, and either in through hole version or in surface mount version. Okay. All right, so now let's move on to uh, uh, the basic anatomy of a plastic encapsulated microcircuit, often called PEM. And believe it or not, up until about the mid, I mean, electronics have been around, microcircuits have been around since 1960s at least, a few in the 50s. Uh, well, really, uh, mostly in the 60s. But for almost 30 years, up until mid 1995s, most high rail applications would not use plastic encapsulated microcircuits. That's partly because the plastics that were being used back then were not that moisture resistant, and partly because people were just nervous. In high rail applications like military or aerospace, they just didn't want to deal with moisture. They didn't know what the effects of it would be. Uh, they just didn't want to deal with it, so they never used PEMS up until mid-1990s. So only around 1995 onwards, uh, high rail applications started to switch over. By then, of course, plastics had improved a lot. There are multiple problems with plastics. They let in moisture, and by their very nature, they have a lot of ionic contaminants in them. They're, by their very composition, they have a lot of ionic <coughs> contaminants in them. So they uh, can accelerate corrosion on all the metal exposed metallization surfaces. So uh, over the years, the plastics industry has learned how to make better plastics that are more moisture resistant, have minimal, very low density of ionic contaminants, and so on. Uh, so the basic structure here is you still have a, this is a lead frame version. There are leadless versions in plastic components too. This particular one is a leaded version. Uh, and this is what we would call, so here the lead has been, it's not a through hole. The lead has been bent back into what we call a gull wing configuration. And in this case, it'll be mounted, surface mounted on a printed circuit board with solder joints on the bottom flat portion over there. So it's not going to, these leads are not going to go through holes in the PWB, but sit on top of matching pads, sit on top of matching pads on the PWB here. So the PWB will have a pad here, and there'll be solder joints. Uh, the die is still, uh, so uh, this is the paddle portion of that lead frame. So what you're looking at here basically is a cross section of so through some region like that, okay, of the lead frame. Now, this is a ceramic package, but the lead frame looks more or less similar. So you're looking at a cross section of the lead frame, and that's what the center paddle looks like. And then here are the leads coming out on the sides. So the die has been mounted down face up, face up meaning the active surfaces facing upwards with die attached material, again, uh, 
that's another huge aspect of packaging is what materials do you use for dye attach. We, we'll talk about that. There's a, a whole section just on that. And then you mold this using any uh, injection molding, transfer molding process. You uh, mold this in plastic case. So it's completely molded in. These are as sealed as it's possible in molding. Okay. And uh, oh, I'm sorry. Before molding, of course, you would wire bond it, and then you would mold it. So that itself is another packaging challenge. After you've done the wire bonding, and uh, we have a whole section on wire bonds, we have a whole section on molding. We'll go through all of that. But just to give you a uh, uh, heads up, uh, once you have wire bonded these, the wire bonds are very slender structures. Then when you put the transfer, put it through the transfer molding process, the, you have the mold, the plastic slurry that's feeding in through the feed gates in the molding process and is sweeping through the cavity, that the cavity will be of this shape, the blue shape. Uh, the wire bonds are presenting a drag resistance, so there's drag forces on the wire bonds, and that causes some damage sometimes. So how to do the molding without damaging the wire bonds is also a bit of an art. Okay. So what are the materials used for the dye attached paddle? So, uh, oh, the paddle. Paddle is, and again, we have a section on lead frames. Uh, it would be the copper, most common material, plated usually with something. And again, there are many different kinds of plating, so we'll talk about that. But most commonly, it's uh, copper. Uh, there are some uh, niche packaging uh, uh, applications where they use uh, uh, low CT materials, like either Kovar or there's another iron nickel alloy, alloy 42. So they use some low CT uh, materials for some applications. Uh, mostly, they're trying to minimize the CT mismatch with the dye, but it causes a different problem. It causes CT mismatch with the solder at this end. So it's always an uh, optimization game. Yeah, it's like a balloon. You press it on one side, it <laughs> bulges out somewhere else. So you try to cure level one problem, you create a level two problem. So it's a system optimization problem. Okay. okay. Uh, so we'll talk about the molding process and all of the associated issues uh, as we go through. Okay. So notice that the mold is directly in contact. Okay. The mold is touching the top of the die. It's touching the wire bonds. It's touching the lead frame. Uh, so it's directly in contact with all of these materials, which is why we have to worry about delaminations in those. I showed you uh, ultrasound scans, uh, acoustic C scans yesterday, where uh, uh, the mold compound had delaminated from the lead frame. Uh, and I'll show that again later today. But those interfaces do delaminate. Moisture then collects in those interfaces, causes corrosion problems, and so on. Okay. So how to optimize those interfaces to minimize delamination is, again, part of the packaging challenge. So they use different kinds of uh, uh, adhesion promoters uh, on the lead frame, on the bottom of the paddle, on the top of the passivation layer to try to promote better adhesion. OK, uh, and, and, and even after all of that is done, think about all these different materials uh, in terms of thermomechanical stresses. Because remember, every time you power this up, uh, everything is going to heat up and expand. Every time you shut it down, it's going to cool down and shrink. Well, these are not, are not all going to expand and shrink by the same amount. The dye is silicon. Let's say it's a silicon dye, 3 to 4 parts per million per degree C. Okay. Uh, the lead frame, if it's copper, is more like 20, give or take, 20 parts per million per degree C. Okay? So big CT mismatch there. That has to be taken up by the dye attach in between. Uh, the mold compound is a very complex polymer. It's not just an ordinary polymer. It's actually filled with various kinds of fillers to tailor the CT. So they try to minimize the CT of this to get closer and closer to the dye. But if it gets close to the die, it has mismatch with the die paddle underneath, which is copper in this case. Or if you match it to the copper, then it has a mismatch with the die. Either way, either the bottom is going to delaminate or the top is going to delaminate because there are big mismatch of thermal expansions at those interfaces. Okay. So they try to shoot for CTs that are somewhere halfway in between. But getting, observing delaminations on the top and bottom is very common. Even in a brand new package, just take it out of the case do an ultrasound scan, and you're likely to find delaminations over there. So uh, uh, in the old days, people used to panic about it. Now we just live with it, some amount of delamination. Those delaminations slowly grow as you temperature cycle up and down. There's fatigue growth of those delaminations. And eventually, moisture makes it, its way into it, and uh, then uh, you have some potential corrosion problems. OK, um, so we'll talk about all of those aspects as we go. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
All right, so here's again a very, very simplified cartoon of what the processes will look like. Okay, so here's uh, your wafers. You're uh, going to be singulating the wafers into individual chips. And then you have these vacuum chucks that will come up and come and pick up the chip, go place it on the lead frame. Notice that the lead frame hasn't been bent yet in this picture. The lead frame is still straight, ribbon to ribbon, on, on ribbons, roll to roll. Okay? So in high volume manufacturing, you'd keep it that way. You'd just uh, mount the uh, chip over there with the right die attached material. And then you would wire bond it. Again, there are automatic wire bonders that will come in and uh, bond those wires. We'll talk about all those processes throughout the day today. And then you would encapsulate it. Notice that in this rendition, it's still, it hasn't been, the lead frames have not been singulated. They're still uh, part of that ribbon, roll to roll ribbon. So all of this is roll to roll manufacturing. And then the encapsulation is done on the roll over there, okay? So with uh, molds, plastic, uh, uh, molds for plastic molding, transfer molding, uh, you make those uh, uh, individual components on that. And, uh, uh, and then, then you would cut off the leads, you would trim, okay? You'd cut off the lead, singulate, uh, then you would uh, form the leads, that's the bending. You can see that the leads have been bent from flat configuration into whichever configuration you want. It could be straight down for through hole, it could be gull wing, it could be J lead, and we'll look at those configurations later. But bottom line, it has to be formed into the right configuration. And then there's a final plating operation because these leads are not left as is. They're not going to be where A, they have to resist environmental corrosion. B, the surfaces have to be solderable because eventually you're going to solder these down on the board. If you leave it as is, surface will oxidize and it won't be very solderable. Okay? So they have to be plated with something that promotes solderability and, and inhibits corrosion. So, uh, and the two ways we'll see later on, the two ways this plating is done. In some cases, the plating is done before it's molded. The entire lead frame is plated. So most noble, uh, the, well, one of the groups of plating materials we'll see later are noble metals, palladium. So they plate it with nickel, undercoat of nickel barrier layer, and then they put palladium on that. So nickel palladium is done uh, before molding. Uh, on the other hand, there are some platings that are done after the uh, component has been plated. Uh, there, that's mostly either tin plating, and then you have tin visco problems, or it's just solder plating. Again, the idea is to create a solderable plating over there. So those are done after molding. So there's either pre-molding uh, plating process or post-molding plating process. So this plating, in some cases, would actually happen. Sorry, would actually happen up here before the lead frame is uh, molded. Okay, and then finally, of course, that's just uh, marking your logos and your part numbers and uh, manufacturer's identification and so on, and then it's. Uh, uh, packaged for ship, shipping. Uh, pack meaning not electronic packaging as we are talking about packaging here, but just putting them in boxes. Right? Okay. Uh, so here I, I kept talking about different lead configurations. Here are some examples of it. So either they are through hole type, right? Pin in hole. That means these are straight leads. They're going to go through uh, matching holes in the circuit card. This uh, uh, open rectangle is a circuit card. This is the component. It's a very simple car cartoon. And uh, that goes, so that is pin and hole. So this would be a very special kind of an architecture. It comes out from the package in a single line. Okay, I'm going to zoom into this one. Try one more time. No, can't zoom there. So it comes out of the package, that's a plastic molded package, it comes out of the package in a single line, but then it's been bent. Uh, alternately, one goes in one direction, the next one goes in the other direction. So this is called uh, zigzag insertion mount. Insertion mount because it's pin and hole, so through hole mount or insertion mount means the pin, uh, interconnection is going to go into a matching hole in the PWB. Okay? And this in particular, and we'll see a list of all those terms later on, uh, this would be a, a zigzag inline pattern, so it would be a zip package. Okay, okay uh, go back. Uh, here's, then we talked about area array packages. I've not shown many of those. Remember, they were dual inline packages and so on. I haven't shown many of those. I'm just showing a few examples over here. So this would be a pin grade array. We already saw a ceramic pin grade array two slides ago. So if you look at the side view, 
those pins will go into matching uh, area array of holes on the circuit card. So the circuit card would have a two-dimensional array of holes, matching holes. Pins would fit into that, and then you would solder them in place in those holes. As opposed to that, as opposed to through-hole mount or insertion mount, the, uh, we have the surface mount. And uh, the majority of circuit cards, to, well, back in the 60s, all we had were through-hole mounts. There were no surface mounts back then. But now, majority of the boards, 90% of boards are surface mount. There are few through-hole components left. Okay? Uh, so surface mount means there are no holes through the circuit card, but there are matching pads on the circuit card, and the component sits on those pads and is soldered in place on those pads. And those pads are also usually mostly copper, okay? with some plating on them again, solderable plating on them again. Uh, and that plating could be either just solder, tin, or gold. Some, uh, some uh, pads are gold finished. Okay, uh, okay so uh, in this case, you can see this package. The uh, lead has been bent over to form a J shape, and that's what it's called. It's called a J-leaded package. So this particular one is a dual inline J-leaded surface mount package. This is what a area array with solder balls will look like. So that's how you buy these components. You buy the component with the solder balls in place, and then you just mount it on matching array of pads on the, solder, uh, on the printed circuit board, and you send it through the reflow oven and get soldered in place. So the solder balls are mounted in there by the package manufacturer. So for example, if you buy a package from Amcor, it'll come with solder balls already on them. Okay? Uh, so you would order it in whatever uh, solder material you want, and they'll send it, the package to you with those solder balls in place. If you buy it without any solder balls, then you have pads over there. Then you have to so create the solder joints between the pad, and, uh, the pad on the component and the pad on the uh, uh, PWB, and that would be called a land grid array. If you buy it without any solder ball, that would just be a land grid array or a pad grid array uh, uh, component. Okay, other lead configurations, a very common one is the gull wing lead. So instead of bending back inwards, you bend it outwards, and uh, uh, those are gull wing leaded qu uh, quad again. So this one was dual in line. Uh, you can have quad J's also. We'll see pictures of quad J's later on. Uh, this is a quad gull wing, and you can have dual inline gull wing too. We'll see pictures of that too later on. So the leads can be of any configuration, and which sides of the package it's coming out can be any configuration. You can mix and match between those. And then finally, the leadless uh, components. So that would be like the component you saw back here. These are leadless components, okay? No leads, just pads like that on the bottom. And then if you look at a side view of it after it's been soldered onto the circuit card, it would look like that. So there's a pad on the bottom, there's metallization also on the side, and the solder, ball for, solder joint forms between a matching pad on the PWB and the sides of the component. We call these, by the way, castellations. Again, just in case I throw those terms around later on, these uh, vertical slots over there that are metallized, those are called castellations. Okay? So I might uh, need to use that term later. Okay, um, so here's a list of, and as long as it looks, it's still an incomplete list. Turns out components come in so many different configurations that it's just impossible to put all of them here. All you've got to do is go to Wikipedia and say electronic packaging architectures, and you'd get you know, dozens and dozens of different configurations. Okay. Uh, so I've just put a few of the common ones over here. So once again, it's been divided into two sections, insertion mount or surface mount. Insertion mount will go into matching holes in the PWB, and this can, difference has been in uh, uh, the older packages were generally larger, and then be, because of modernization and miniaturization, people started to shrink their package size down. So these are the shrink packages, and uh, uh, these are the standard dimensions. So DIP is dual inline package. You already saw that. ZIP is zigzag inline package. You saw that. That was zigzag inline. That's a dual inline, uh, except that surface mount, the dual inline through hole you saw here. That's a dual inline. Uh, that's a dual inline through hole. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then that's a single inline package. I'll show you in the next slide. I'll show you a picture of a single inline package. Uh, and uh, the zigzag, the zip package, the zigzag inline you just saw before. 
Uh, and then uh, you have smaller versions of those, so that's like a shrink dip. So that would be just a dip package, but in smaller uh, dimensions and smaller pitches. And similarly, you can have uh, uh, shrink versions of almost all of these packages. Okay? And then I've also put down the pin grid array over here. So that's an area array, pin grid array. You saw that already. Same thing in surface mount. You can uh, divide them up by what kinds of lead architectures you have. So here's a gullwing leaded package. It could be two-sided or four-sided. Within two-sided, you've got all these multiple acronyms. So SOP is a small outline package. Okay. Uh, uh, then uh, this one comes with a heat sink built in. HSOP is a uh, small outline package with a heat sink built in. Uh, TSOP is same dual inline package, but very thin for miniaturization purposes. So very flat packaging like these slimline products or your cell phones. We can have a standard dip. It's way too tall. We need uh, very low profile components. So we go to thin outline packages for that. So a thin SOP would be a TSOP package. A shrink SOP would be a standard, uh, standard outline package, but smaller dimensions. And then you could have a thin shrink SOP and so on. So you start to get the picture. You have all these permutation combinations of all the f uh, different architectures that packaging companies can come up with. Okay? So, uh, and that's what those acronyms basically mean. Okay, then on the quad type, you have, uh, so these, these are all two-sided packages, okay? These are four-sided, leads coming out on all four sides. So, but these are still all perimeter, not area array, but only uh, leads coming out the sides, uh, of the uh, perimeter of the package, okay? Uh, so here, the quad flat pack was gull wing. <laughs> now, as, again, just like SOPs, you have the thin quad, uh, thin quad flat pack, you have a fine pitch quad flat pack for very high I.O. Uh, you have very fine pitch, okay? Uh, you have quad flat packs with heat sinks on them, HQFP, and so on. And then uh, here are J leads. Uh, so J leads, again, you can divide between uh, two-sided and four-sided. The two-sided one would be an S uh, small outline J. Uh, two-sided would be a quad flat J. But it's also called a PLCC. Don't ask me how that name came about. It's a, called a plastic leaded chip carrier. Why not just stick with QFJ? I don't know. But it when they first came out, they were called PLCCs. Eventually, people commonized the names and said, let's just, if everything else is going to be a quad flat something, then this is a quad flat J. Okay. Okay. Then there are leadless varieties. Okay. No leads at all. Just like the, uh, uh, sorry, just like the leadless carrier we had here. Uh, not here. J so, sorry, just like the leadless carrier here, okay? So uh, those are called, here we go, non-leaded. Again, they can be either four parameters or area array. So uh, the, uh, common terminology for the one that are along the perimeter is again either leadless chip carrier, old terminology, or, or current terminology is quad flat no lead, QFN. That's a more modern terminology. And then if you have pads over the entire area, that's a land grade array, okay, two-dimensional array throughout the entire uh, bottom of the package. And then there are other versions. We'll talk about this. Tab bonded is a totally different uh, technology. We'll talk about tab bonded. And then there are ball grade arrays. We already discussed that. Instead of leads, they come with, instead of leads, they come with solder balls on the pads. So you can convert a land grade array component into a ball grade array component by just selling them with solder balls on them, okay? Okay, the tab I'm gonna discuss later on because that's a little bit of a different technology. Okay, bottom line, yes, so you start to get a feel for, there are only so many combinations, okay? You have either surface mount, hasn't come yet, Okay, I'll keep writing in the meantime, so by the time it comes up, you can see it. And then you have, Okay, I'll walk you through this in a minute. 
it's not easy being left-handed. Okay, and uh, uh, one more. Okay, so basically the divisions are categorizations are it could be the insertion mount in hole or surface mount, and then it could be the perimeter uh, two-sided, four-sided, uh, four or single-sided, or over the entire area, two-dimensional, over the entire bottom of the package. That would be area array. Then it could be, you could have leads or no leads, okay, leaded versus leadless. And of course, you could have hermetic, ceramic, or metal versus plastic. Okay, so those are the basic categorizations, mix and match any combinations of these. And then there comes all the miniaturization. Uh, small outline package versus regular, thin outline package versus regular, uh, fine pitch versus regular pitch. So the, all of these are miniaturization technologies. And then you could have combinations of those, thin, small, fine pitch, or small, thin, or thin, fine pitch. You could have any combinations of those. And then finally, you could have heat sink or no heat sink. versus regular. You usually don't add a separate n name if there's no heat sink, but if there's a heat sink, there's a H that gets thrown in the two. So you can mix and match any one of these combinations. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six categories of uh, uh, architectures. You can mix and, max these, uh, mix and match these architectures in various forms. Okay? Total number of combinations would be a lot, yes. Not necessarily. So the area array could be at the second level. The IC could be wire bonded inside the package, and we'll see examples of that. And then the package itself is wire, a ball grade arrayed onto, right? Uh, on the other hand, if the in some configurations the die itself will be flip chipped inside the package substrate, and then the package itself will be ball graded down to the board. We'll see all those examples this afternoon. Okay, so here are some uh, pictures to go with those names. Here's an example of a single inline package. Okay, only one row of leads coming out the bottom. This would be the bottom. So basically, we've taken the, the leads coming out in the bottom. We're looking at this sideways. So the leads are now on the side, but actually that would be mounted vertically into the circuit card. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, so the die is inside. It's molded, plastic molded. Uh, there's a heat sink over there. You can see that the heat sink is sticking out over here, so you can transmit the heat away. And then there are uh, leads over here. In this particular case, example, it's a copper lead. Actually, it's not pure copper, of course. It's a copper alloy. And then, in this case, it's been solder plated. Remember, I said it could be tin plated, solder plated, or plated with a noble metal. If it's plated with a noble metal, usually it's done before the molding. And the noble metal could be gold, palladium. Usually there'll be a barrier layer of nickel underneath, and then gold or palladium on top of that. Or you would do post-molding plating, there it'll be just solder or, uh, or uh, uh, tin. OK, okay uh, so that's one example. of, uh, and, and then again, the uh, bond wires in this case, in this example, happens to be gold. It could be gold or aluminum or copper. Those are the three leading candidates for bond wires. Each has its own advantages and disadvantages. We'll talk about that later. But there's a section on bond wires later on. Right now, we, all we're doing is just learning the uh, terminology and trying to put some pictures in our head to match a uh, face with the name. Okay. All right, so here's a dual inline package. You've seen a ceramic version. This is a plastic molded version of a dual inline package. Uh, again, wire bonded chip inside, single chip, wire bonded. So very old classical technology, okay? And here's the lead frame. Uh, the wire bond goes from the bond pad on the die to the lead frame. And the leads in this example are uh, alloy 42, okay? And iron and nickel is alloy 42. Uh, it can be iron, cobalt, and nickel. That would be covar, or it could be copper. So those are all candidate materials for lead frames. Uh, and then uh, you can see there's a die paddle over there, die pad, and then die attach, and then the die, and then the mold compound on top. In this particular case, the die attach, in this example, it happens to be an organic. It's a polymer die attach. Die attaches can be metals or polymers, and we'll talk about all those materials later. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, here is a small outline package. Okay, so th these are not as tall as regular packages anymore. These are small outline because they have to fit into slimline packages. Well, and then they're further, well, first off, the dimensions are much smaller than a regular package. The dimensions of the overall package are just a little bit larger than the die, as opposed to here, where the overall dimensions are much larger than the die. So the, here the pitch is much larger, here the pitches are generally smaller, leads are smaller, package is smaller, and you're basically trying to miniaturize. And then you can further make this a very thin package, then it would become a thin small outline package, a TSOP, okay? All right, again, I'm not gonna go through the rest of it, we've been through this several times, die, bond, wire bonds, leads, so on. Okay, so here are the thin small outline packages, TSOPs, okay, and the two that uh, and I mentioned it could be thin small outline, shrink small outline, and a combination, both thin and shrink. Shrink means it's already going from regular package to small outline, you went smaller. Shrink is even smaller, and then in the vertical direction, you also go smaller, that's thin. So these are very tiny packages for very high density packaging uh, in very, very tiny spaces. And these, all three packages come in two configurations, either type one, where, and most of these are rectangular packages, by the way. So some come with the leads along the short side, some come with leads along the long side. And then these are just shown in flat configuration. These leads will be now formed in whatever shape you want. Typically, most of these are gull wing. Most uh, T-SOPs and uh, S-SOPs and uh, T-SOPs are usually gull wing leads, okay? Okay, and uh, even the, gull, the height of the gull wing lead, I'll draw this also, is a critical parameter, we'll see that later. So here's the PWB, here's your TSOP component. Here are the gull wing leads. Here's the matching, sorry, matching copper pad on PWB, and here's the solder, solder joint. So it's a surface mount configuration mounted on the surface of the PWB. And, oops, now I still need this. Do I have to write on it, keep the pen on it? Okay. So uh, uh, this height is also critical. So it's not enough to just shrink this to fit into t uh, tight spaces. You also have to shrink the height of the lead. And uh, that creates other problems because the reason we have these leads is to provide some compliance. Why? Because thermal expansion mismatch between the component and the PWB has to be taken up by the solder joint. So if I don't have any leads, if I just have a leadless package with solder joints under them and copper pads and PWB, then the CT mismatch is taken up purely by the solder joint. The solder joint fatigues very quickly as you power cycle or temperature cycle. So the purpose of the lead is to provide some compliance. So part of the deformation, mismatch deformation goes in the leads and only a part goes in the solder. That's how you improve solder joint life. But if you reduce that height, you're basically taking away some of that compliance, right? So uh, uh, this family of packages, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so this family of packages, these uh, thin SOPs, TSOPs, which have very low lead height, uh, usually have some solder joint issues. So we see a lot of uh, users coming to us with solder joint problems and TSOPs. Uh, especially this configuration, type one. Think about it, the thermal expansion mismatch, in this case, you are interested in that dimension. And thermal expansion mismatch is proportional to the dimension. So the Demand, uh, the mismatch is smaller because this length is smaller and the mismatch is higher in this configuration because that length of the component is high, uh, longer. So this configuration, type 1 TSOPs, we see a lot of solder joint issues. Okay, let's move on here. Uh, so here's a quad J leaded component. I'd earlier showed you a quad, uh, uh, dual J. This is a quad J. Uh, old name used to be PLCC, now people just call them QFJs, quad, uh, sorry, Q, uh, what was that, Q, uh, J lead, 
QFJ, yeah, quad flat J. Okay, okay. So, so that is actually an old name, PLCC. But this is what the component looks like. So once again, here's the classical molded component. I'm not going to go to the individual parts again. Here's the lead frame coming out on all four sides, coming out of the sides of the package. And now instead of bending the leads, bottom of the leads outward like a gull wing, they've bent it back inwards as a J. And there's a reason for that. You can see that if you bend it outwards, it requires a bigger footprint on the circuit card. So if you really tight, if you're real in real tight spaces and you want to shrink the footprint of the component, you go to a J-leaded version because uh, uh, then it occupies less space on the PWB. Uh, OK. Uh, now here's a classical quad flat gull wing. Okay? It's just called a QFP, quad flat pack, but it actually should have been called a quad flat gull wing. But they just call them uh, PQ, uh, <coughs> either plastic QFPs or ceramic QFPs. This is a plastic QFPs, QFP. And again, you can see all the standard uh, anatomy. I'm not going to go through all of that. So it's a four-sided surface mount package, just as this too was a four-sided surface mount package. OK. Um, and here are some versions of QFPs. You have just the standard QFP. And what makes it standard? The dimensions. Okay, So in this range, you would get standard QFPs with these kinds of lead counts. Uh, fine pitch quad flat packs would have much closer spaced, so the pitch would be much smaller. Okay, Instead of having pitches from 0.65 to 1 millimeter, that's the space between leads, these would be down to about 0.4 millimeters, Okay, spaced much closer. Therefore, you can fit more leads into that package. So this goes up to about 376. There are some QFPs that have higher in the range of about 500 IOs. I've seen some of those. Uh, so one of the problems with these fine pitch QFPs is that these leads get very slender. And uh, those are not very good components for vibration applications because now you've got these very compliant leads and the component mass hanging on top of compliant leads. Uh, the natural frequency in vibration mode is pretty low. And uh, that poses vibration hazards, uh, or reliability hazards and vibration. OK, so that's fine pitch. And then just like the SOPs, you can have a thin version. So the, here you reduce the body thickness from about 2 to 4 millimeters to 1 to 1.4 millimeters. Okay? So you could have fine pitch, thin quad flat packs. Okay? So you're starting to get the picture. It's, again, those permutation combinations of those six categories that are put up. Okay? Uh, some of the package dimensions that are important to, let's say, for the level two people, uh, people who are designing circuit cards to accept these components, they would need to know. So when you're ordering a component from a component supplier, you would need to know what these dimensions are, the width of the lead, the pitch, that's the spacing between leads, the thickness, the height of the package, because your uh, level two packaging has to have all those dimensions in mind, because what kind of... Uh, pad I design in the circuit card depends on that architecture, right? OK. Uh, and uh, here are those dimensions. This is just for your reference later on. It's in your handout. So uh, different categories have these ranges of those dimensions, OK? OK. Uh, so here's a summary. Uh, again, this is. Uh, in hindsight, I wish I'd made a summary of those six categories, and I'll probably make an additional slide and send that to you later, because uh, this is this summary is still a somewhat incomplete summary. Let's go back over here. So you can see what those configurations are. You can have through hole, or you can have surface mount gullwing, surface mount J, surface mount no lead, or surface mount a, uh, uh, solder ball. Solder ball comes only in the array of, uh, area array version, and in terms of where the IOs are coming out of from the package, it could be either, so the first three are perimeter, one-sided, two-sided, or four-sided perimeter leads, and the last one is area array over the entire bottom of the package. So depending on which of these permutations it falls into, or combinations it falls into, they get different sets of names. And now you can have, for every one of these, you can have thin version, shrink version, heat sink version, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, question. 
That's the end of this session. It's just, again, a very high-level overview of terminology that I'll throw around now, for the, and so we'll uh, Andrew for the rest of the days over here, uh, two and, uh, three and a half days, OK? All right, no questions? Let's move on. Yeah. I'm not sure uh, this question needs to be asked uh, in this time because we are talking about this time. Mm -hmm. uh, just to want to know, like, uh, you know, the, the category, they segregate the package into three versions, like the commercial, industrial, and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, these three versions are depends on the reliability of the material. Yes. 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 So absolutely. So your question is. Is it based on reliability? Is that your question? OK. Yeah. So predominantly reliability. Uh, typically, the high reliability versions, which would be the hierarchy would be military, aerospace grade, industrial grade, and then commercial grade. So typically, the high rel versions have higher cost materials, uh, very low ionic, uh, percentage of ionic contaminants in your plastics, very closely uh, controlled dimensions. Uh, die attached materials have to be carefully selected to be uh, highly reliable. The plating materials will either be gold or noble, noble metal. So uh, those are the high rel versions. More importantly, the high rel versions have gone through a lot of qualification testing. And you can actually buy those qualification test results. And the higher cost you're paying is even more than the material cost you're paying for the <coughs> inspections, the burn in, and the qualification tests. So that's where the cost is going. The consumer versions, consumer electronics versions, the commercial versions, uh, don't go through as much quality, tight quality control as now. So once again, just to uh, uh, play, uh, b b place this in context, this is what we're talking about. So this is the step we're talking about. Okay? How do we go from single chip to a packaged chip? Okay. OK, and uh, once again, this is for continuity. I've put up this assembly flow chart just so we can uh, use some of this terminology. So the basic steps are we'll talk about how do we do die attach, what are the materials for that, what are the concerns, how do we do uh, uh, interconnecting, could be wire bond, could be tab, could be solders, how do we do that, and what are the considerations. Then encapsulation, what are the considerations, and then trim, form, plate, what are the considerations, OK, or materials and considerations. So this session is split into one, two, three, four subsections, OK? OK, so let's start with the lead frame. We'll start with this basic lead frame that we are going to die attach to, OK? Uh, so that's, it's just a carrier, and it comes in long ribbons, like I said. It's uh, made by reel-to-reel -reel manufacturing. And uh, the materials, actually, Kovar is missing over here. There are three <coughs> materials of choice. Uh, vast majority of components come with copper alloys. Very few come with alloy 42 or Kovar. Most of them are with copper alloys. CT is about 17, close to 20, OK? About 17. And it's matched. Uh, it's close to the mold compound is usually tailored to about 15 to 20. So it's matched close to that. And depends on application. Some mold compounds will come with even lower CT than that to be halfway between silicon and the lead frame. And then especially these, uh, for Alloy 42, these have very low CT, very close to the silicon chip. And they're either those are used in ceramic or metal chip carriers, the hermetic ones, or you have to use a plastic mold compound that is very, very low CT. How do you tailor the CT of mold compounds? By putting in fillers. Uh, silica fillers, you control the overall effective. So you've created a composite material. Go back to Professor Ramanujan's uh, example yesterday, he said, when you have a composite, how, how do you find effective properties? Well, the, here we're talking about effective CTE. CTE is coefficient of thermal expansion. Right? Uh, similarly, there's effective mechanical properties we're interested in. There are effective dielectric constants we're interested in. Effective thermal properties we're interested in. Effective moisture absorption properties we're interested in. All those fillers change those effective properties, because now it's a composite. It's not a homogeneous material anymore. Okay. So, once you start delving into details very quickly, it gets very deep. We don't have the time to do all that, unfortunately, in a uh, one-week course. Okay. But just to give you an example, there are groups in my uh, center, Professor Bonte Hans' group, for example, 
he spends about 30% of his time, and he's done that for the last 10 years, just working on uh, mold compounds. So endless amount of research goes into making better and better mold compounds and trying to model them, finding all the effective properties, and so on. Okay. So these are complex uh, problems. Not to mention they're also viscoplastic because they're polymers at the end of the day, so the effective properties get very, very complicated. They're temperature sensitive, they're rate sensitive, et cetera. Uh, and by rate sensitive, I mean if I were to mo uh, model one of these components with the mold compound and everything in a, a detailed model, say a finite element model, and I want to see the effective behavior of this component, I cannot use the same properties for thermal cycling that I would use for vibration simulation because the effective properties are rate sensitive. Uh, and temperature sensitive, so I have to be very cautious. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, so uh, the function we have already seen, they are basically just a mechanical support, physical support, and also they provide a heat dissipation path, very important uh, part of the uh, thermal pathway, right, uh, to remove heat from the dye outwards. And uh, materials, we already just went through it. So copper, of course, has excellent electrical resistivity compared to, uh, compared to uh, alloy 42. The only reason the alloy 42 is used, and again, like I said, it's mostly in hermetic parts, uh, there there's no mold compound to worry about, so they would try to match the uh, lead frame to the, the CT of the lead frame to that of the silicon to try to minimize failures of die attach, because otherwise the die attach has to take the thermal expansion mismatch and the die attach would fail. And that's a classic example of the package designer not thinking of what happens downstream. They created a huge problem with solder joint failures because one, Kovar is much stiffer, it's not listed here, but it's Young's modulus is much higher than copper. So go back to our picture of compliance. I'm gonna have to have these people back on the pad. Okay, so go back here. If this is made out of copper versus Kovar or alloy 42, okay, either one. This is stiff. This is, rel in relative terms, much more compliant, okay? Remember, we said the purpose of the lead is to provide compliance. You put in a stiff material there, you've lost all the compliance. The solder joint is now at risk, one reason. The second reason is copper CTE is about 17, solder CTE is about 22. Alloy 42, CT is about 5, solder is 22. So think about that interface, the solder, we call that local CT mismatch, okay? Uh, the global CT mismatch is the mismatch between the component and the PWB. The local CT mismatch is the CT mismatch between the lead and the solder, which are connected to each other. So if those two are not CT matched, you, the interface sees a lot of stresses. So if you have alloy 42 with five parts per million per degree C versus this with 22 parts per million per degree C, you've got a huge thermal expansion mismatch at that interface, and that's a double whammy. You've got a stiff lead with a big CT mismatch, the solder joint fails very quickly. So the package designers who used to put those Kovar and alloy 42 leads uh, never really thought it through at a system level. Okay. okay, they were just trying to protect the die attach and be done with it. Okay. All right. Um, oh, there's one other. Okay. Uh, and these, by the way, are also more expensive. Copper is way cheaper, so that's that last bullet over there. Copper is, of course, not as expensive as either alloy 42 or Kovar. Kovar just has additional cobalt in there. So there's nickel, cobalt, iron in Kovar, and uh, alloy 42 does not have the cobalt. But obviously, those are more expensive. Okay, so here are some examples. So that's uh, uh, copper iron. This is, uh, so these are various different kinds of materials. These are, uh, I remember I told you the copper is also alloyed. It's not pure copper. So these would be in the category of copper uh, lead frames. This is pure copper, not used very extensively. There's a little bit of zirconium, but uh, that's just microalloying. okay? So this is not used very commonly. These are, okay? So these are used extensively for lead frame materials. And uh, these are the alloy 42 and Kovar, uh, hardly used nowadays. Uh, they were common once upon a time in hermetic packages, uh, not used very extensively anymore. You can see, A, they are stiffer than copper, okay? And uh, you can see, more importantly, you can see the CTE. Uh, these are down at about five, 
whereas these are matched much closer to that of solder. Of course, the problem now becomes between the die and the lead frame. The die attach has to take up that mismatch, and we'll talk about that, so what kind of die attaches are needed. Okay. Okay, so here's a typical lead frame assembly. So there'd be side by side. So this is just one unit, single unit. There would be side by side many such units stamped out of a ribbon, long ribbon, roll to roll. Okay, and uh, so you can see that the die paddle is in the middle. The lead frames all come out to this common piece over here, and uh, then the leads extend out over there. So these all have to be separated out with additional uh, stamp and trimming operations later on. Okay, and then you'd remove this uh, outer ring. You would remove that later on the side rail you would remove later on in the trimming process. OK. Um, so again, as I said, it comes out of uh, strips. So what you do is you cast these metal strips. You roll them, hot roll, cold roll, get, make them into thin strips. So now it, they get these long ribbons. And then by uh, stamping or etching, you make these lead frames. Etching is a slow process. It's still done, but it takes longer time. It's expensive. It's usually done for prototypes and short production runs. Uh, stamping is excellent when you have high volume manufacturing. But if you don't have high volume manufacturing, it's not worth investing in the tooling for stamping. Then you do it with etching. Okay, so for small runs, especially prototyping, etching is normally used. But that's a slow, expensive process. For high volume manufacturing, you would do that. Uh, and then I talked about the plating. And uh, the reasons, as we said, is to uh, twofold. One is to protect from the environment, uh, reduce corrosion oxidation. And second is to preserve the solderability of the leads, because you make these components. They stay in storage at the distributor's end. They're, they're transported. And weeks, sometimes months later, someone buys it to put it on a circuit card. In those weeks, all the leads have oxidized, and uh, you cannot solder them anymore. So you have to put some kind of a soldering preser uh, preservative as a plating material. And those are usually either, uh, uh, as I said, uh, either uh, pre-plated with noble metals, gold and nickel palladium, or post-plated after encapsulation with uh, uh, either solder or tin, okay, pure tin. Now, of course, there's whiskering risks when you do that also, okay? Okay, so post-encapsulation is tin or solder. Uh, it didn't get written in over here. Because solder is not that common anymore. 80% of parts come with just tin plating, okay? But some are solder plated also. And then there's the uh, nickel palladium and gold. Okay. Um, nickel palladium, by the way, was first started with TI back in the uh, 1980s. And uh, uh, now it's used fairly extensively. It's, it's a noble metal, but it's cheaper than gold, obviously. So they wanted a cheaper alternative to gold, and they moved to palladium. OK, so, uh, so that's the lead frame. Now let's move on to the die attach. So the die attach is going to be between this die paddle and the die that's going to chip that's going to go on top, right? So uh, think about, and let's just go to one of the architectures. This is not a good one. I have to open. Let's use this. So this is the die attach. Okay, the black material here is the die attach. It's going to be between the lead frame, which is again copper or alloy 42, and the die. So once again, so it has to uh, form a, a strong bond between the lead frame and the die. So it must be very bondable to the lead frame material, whether it be copper or alloy 42 or kovar, with the plating that it has, if it's pre-plated. And on the other side, it must bond very well to the back of the silicon die. Okay, so it must have those characteristics. Uh, For die attach, no, no. It's uh, either polymers or solders or uh, a new class of materials are uh, intermetallics, TLPS, transient liquid phase soldering. I'll, I'll talk about those. Okay. Sorry, I'm in the wrong presentation. Go to the other one. <coughs> 
So that's the dye attached material we're going to talk about now. Uh, so the me mechanical function is, of course, uh, attached the dye to the lead frame paddle or the dye pad. And uh, it also has a heat transfer purpose. So uh, if the heat has to get to the dye paddle and through the lead frame out, the dye attached must allow the dye to transmit that heat uh, to the uh, dye paddle. So if you put in a low thermal conductivity material there, it forms a resistance, thermal resistance in your thermal pathway. So that's not acceptable. And again, of course, whether you're using metal dye attach or a polymer dye attach makes a big difference to that, right? OK, so what are the considerations? Uh, of course, uh, adhesion. I talked about that already, adhesion to the uh, underside of the dye and adhesion to the lead frame on the bottom. Uh, the stresses. So if you put in a very stiff material that has a very different thermal expansion coefficient from the dye, then there'll be thermal expansion mismatch. Let's draw a picture. Or this is the paddle, really, dye paddle. This is the dye, which is wire bonded out, OK? And this is the dye attach. OK. Uh, <clears throat> so now you've got this one expanding at uh, f about 4 parts per million per degree C. This one expanding at about 17 parts per million per degree C. Uh, that mismatch has to be, is going to go in the dye attach. And the dye attach itself has its own CTE. Okay? We usually use the letter alpha for CTE, alpha of the dye attach. So once you form this dye attach at high temperature and then you cool everything down, usually the dye attach CTE would be much higher than the dye. So there's a mismatch at that interface and all that goes into the dye. So the dye is under stress once you cool it down. It can, if you use a very stiff dye attach, it can crack the dye, generate such a high stress that it'll actually crack the dye. So that's what we're talking about here. If you, sorry, if you go over here, back to, so the thermomechanical stress on the dye that we're talking about is what the residual stress that gets locked into the dye when you form the dye attach, when you do the dye attach bonding, okay? Okay. Uh, if you use polymer, uh, there are polymer dye attaches and there are metal dye attaches. If you use polymer dye attaches, then you have extra issues. Polymers over time will outgas. They, they all have volatiles, and the slowly the volatiles will uh, come out. And uh, those contain ionic contaminants. So what you now have is outgassing of ionic contaminants in close proximity of the dye and the metallization, and that's a corrosion risk. So uh, outgassing is something uh, we hate, I mean, packaging engineers hate, and polymer dye attaches have that risk. So typically, people look for special polymers that have low outgassing. Again, cheap polymers for commercial parts, unfortunately, will outgas more. The high rail ones will use specially tailored polymers that have low outgassing. So, <clears throat> OK, uh, thermal stability. So if you're going to use these components at high temperature, what's high temperature? Uh, how high do you think electronics need to operate at? How high a temperature do you think electronics need to operate at? Think about high temperature applications of electronics. What do you think? It depends on the case, yeah. Right? So take a guess. <coughs> uh, maximum you push max is around 90 degrees. Okay. So uh, <coughs> your environment can be maybe 40 some places even 50 degrees C, and now you're operating the electronics, there's a delta T because of the heat that's being generated by the electronics, so inside the enclosure it's hotter, inside the par uh, chip it's hotter, uh, so the die attach may be, I don't know, you said 90, I'll say maybe 110, okay? But that's when the ambient temperature is 50 degrees C. What about applications where I'm gonna measure, uh, put in sensors and electronics in the exhaust of my engine? either aerospace engines or, uh, or uh, automobiles. You've got sensors in your uh, engine, and increasingly people are wanting to put the electronics with the MEMS sensors right there on site. You don't want the MEMS here and your signal processor somewhere else. You want them next to each other. 
Now it has to survive what kind of temperature? 850 degrees C. And even if you don't talk about such exotic applications, there are other exotic applications. Uh, uh, absolutely, the oil industry drills down for oil about five kilometers under the surface. So their drill strings are about five kilometers long. So think about, uh, well, it goes partly down, vertically down, and then it goes either horizontally or at an incline. It's not all vertically five kilometers down. But the total drill string is typically five kilometers plus long. That's how long the drill string is. Each time there's a failure of some kind, they have to extract the entire drill string and uh, repair. So if it hits some hard rock or something and you damage the drill bit, you have to uh, retract the entire drill string all five kilometers of it repair and go back in. That's, if not hours, that's days. I mean, if not days, it's at least hours. Do you know what the production, the loss rate is per hour in a oil drilling exploration enterprise? You're talking several million dollars an hour, okay? So uh, obviously they don't want to bear that cost, so they want to minimize the amount of damage. So for that, they want sensors at the tip of the drill bit that senses what's the hardness of the material they're up against so that they can tailor the RPMs and the feed rates based on the hardness that they're hitting. So the sensors and electronics and controllers at the tip of the drill bit, five kilometers underneath, in the middle of all that slurry and hard debris that's coming up the drill bit and out to the external, in the middle of all that mounted in the drill bit are electronics at the drill tip. Okay. What temperatures do you think they're seeing? I mean, forget all the mechanical stresses of drilling through a hard material. What temperatures do you think they're seeing? 400, 450 degrees C. So they want, and they do some minimal amount of cooling that they can manage to do on site because there's a liquid slurry and everything. There's some amount of indirect cooling. So it comes down to about 350 degrees C. But they want electronics that will operate at 350 degrees C. That's their ambient. So the point is, high temperature applications just go through the roof. It's a different ball game altogether. So they're looking for totally different classes of materials. None of the materials we're talking about here today will work for them. They have entirely different set material sets. And they make all their electronics. There's no supplier out there to make the electronics. They make all their own stuff. Uh, so uh, there is a two different types of things, right? Mm -hmm. One is a uh, continuous temperature we mm -hmm. monitor, mm -hmm. or there will be an injected temperature that is for the instant temperature to it increases and it drops. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So uh, to give you that example of the oil exploration or the engine exhaust, yeah. your ambient, steady ambient, is at 350. Yes. And then when you fire up the electronics, there's a delta T on top of that, right? Uh, uh, but there, at least for the period of operation, of, uh, uh, many of them actually are drilling close to 24 hours a day because they just cannot afford to keep these idle, okay? So they're running three shifts, 24 hours a day almost. Uh, but having said that, there's some downtime. And during that time, everything shuts down. The temperatures, the ambient temperature is still high, but the electronics are not working, so uh, uh, you don't have that additional delta T of powering up. But uh, when everything is running, yeah, you're at 400 degrees C. And uh, same thing with the uh, exhaust. Only when the engine is fired and the engine is operating, you're up at 850 degrees C. The rest of the time when it's just sitting somewhere, not driving, it's not, uh, it's an ambient tip. Which is, again, a good and a bad. The good part is, part of the time is not seeing a high temperature, but the bad part is now it's cycling between high and low, high and low. And that cycling also is a problem, right, for fatigue. So if you just kept it at a high temperature all the time, you'd get one set of failure mechanisms that hate the heat, but you wouldn't get any fatigue failures because there's no cycling. Whereas when you cycle it up and down, these guys are happy because it's not at high temperature all the time, but all the fatigue failure mechanisms are now going crazy because you're cycling up and down. Okay, so that's where the term, that long story was to try to explain why thermal stability is important, okay? Uh, so some electronics have to work at very, very high temperatures, so thermal stability, that means at high temperature, these materials have to retain their properties for however many years this electronics has to last. They cannot break down at high temperature. 
Uh, so there again, obviously, you can imagine there are no polymer dye attaches being used for the kinds of applications I just talked about. OK. Uh, and then, of course, it's in your thermal pathway. We talked about that. So thermal conductivity, specific heat, its ability to dissipate that heat, all of those are extremely important properties. And finally, at the end of the day, or at the beginning of the day, <laughs> there's uh, manufacturability and cost. Right? Um, end of the day is just a, just a slang. It doesn't mean it comes at the end. <laughs> it means before you're done with the day, you have to worry about cost, too. And usually, it, should start, it starts with the cost. OK. All right. Um, so here are the kinds of materials. Uh, on polymer side, you can have epoxy-based materials, or for higher temperature applications, polyimide-based materials. Now, there's a lot of just information here. We don't have time to go through every bullet over here. These are handouts. These are resource materials. You can always go, go back and look at all the numbers and data over there. I'll just give you the overall uh, uh, broad pieces of information that are important. So when you have high temperature requirements, we go to polyimides. Lower normal temperatures, anything uh, below about 200 degrees C or so. Uh, I'm sorry, anything below 150 degrees C or so, uh, epoxies are good enough. For high temperatures, we have to go to uh, polyimides. The downside is you have to cure them at high temperatures, and all the electronics have to survive the curing temperature. So everything has a downside. Okay. All right. Uh, and they're expensive. Polyimides are not cheap. So unless you have a high temperature requirement, people normally wouldn't go to polyimides. They would just go with an ordinary epoxy. OK. Um, then comes the metal, uh, uh, the metallic ones. So typically, these are either solder or for very high temperature applications. These are silver glass. That means these are glass frit. There's glass pieces in a silver uh, matrix, molten. So uh, uh, it's the same material that you use for sealing hermetic packages and things like that. So these are good up to 400 degrees C. The solder die attaches would be only as good as their melt temperatures. So for example, tin lead solder, oh, I'll come to that one later. That's a high lead tin lead solder. That's a high temperature solder. I'll come to that later. But the eutectic tin lead solder melts at about 185 degrees C. SAC solders melt anywhere between 210 to 220 de or 230 degrees C. So these are slightly higher temperature. And these are high temperature solders. High lead solders melt. Uh, who remembers the melt temperature of high lead solders? It's about uh, at least 200 degrees C, if I'm not mistaken. When, if you guys get a chance, just Google melt temperature of 95.5 uh, uh, solder and let me know. OK. Uh, okay. Uh, so bottom line, for high temperature applications, we still use this. And by the way, as many of you might know already, the reason we've moved to these SAC solders, which is tin, silver, copper, that means the lead is missing here, right? Sorry, this is tin, silver, anemone. The lead is missing over here. The uh, lead has been banned, basically. So, uh, and again, here's economy of scale. Lead got banned, and high rail people said, well, we don't know how all these new solders behave. We're going to continue to make it with tin lead solder. And they have a waiver from government, various governments all around the world gave high rail people uh, exemptions for however many years. They still have, some of those exemptions still haven't expired. So they can use tin lead solders because they have used them for many years. They know how they work. Uh, they can guarantee their reliability. But the supply chain said, we're not making a few lead, tin lead pieces for you guys. We have, for example, ball grid arrays. You try to order a ball grid array with tin lead solder ball, good luck. Nowhere to be found. All the component manufacturers said, that's your problem. Uh, we only manufacture one type, and that's axe solder, and take it or leave it. So high rail people go through all kinds of acrobatics. They buy the commercial parts. They get rid of all the solder balls, right? deball them. Put tin lead solder ball on them. Think about all these extra thermal cycles that uh, electronics are going through inside the part. You're deballing, right? That means you're removing the solder. Sometimes it's done partly mechanically, but ultimately you have to heat it up to remove all the solder. Then you resolder the new ball on it, and then you reflow all of that on the circuit card. You have increased the amount of handling and uh, number of thermal excursions. And a lot of those parts suffer from. So the reason. The high rail people do that is for higher reliability. What they've created is a problem now that now has a lower reliability. Okay, so it's, there's a cash train too. Okay, uh, this is the other class of materials that is uh, has survived these waivers, these bands. There's a, a waiver that you can 
wherever there's high temperature requirement, like uh, the ones we were talking about, uh, the people making electronics for downhole and so on, they still use these high lead solders because uh, those are high melt temperature solders and they're waivers for them. Okay. These are also used in what we'll talk about later as uh, slip chip bonding, and I'll explain later why. Okay. Uh, so we have to discuss that not all the solders in your component have the same temperature. There's a hierarchy of temperature depending on which operation is done first, which operation is done next, and so on. I'll explain all that later on. And in that hierarchy, flip chip bonding sometimes still uses uh, high lead solders, high melt temperature solders. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so these are the solders. This, we already did the glass frit, very high temperature. And these are not quite as high temperature as glass frit, but certainly higher temperature than these solders. This is a different kind of solder. These are called hard solders. These are uh, eutectic combinations of gold and other metals, so gold and silicon, gold and germanium, so different co uh, uh, combinations. And uh, those alloys uh, have very, very high melt temperature. They're also very rigid. So go back to this example I gave you, uh, back to our pad, writing pad. So if this is conventional solder, then it's relatively compliant, okay? If it is hard, so this is conventional solder. That means tin lead or SAC or uh, high lead conventional solder. If it's a hard solder, which is gold with tin or gold with, uh, sorry, gold silicon, gold germanium, etc. Those are very stiff in, in, uh, in comparison. And then you also had the silver glass, also very stiff. So if this is very stiff, then as it shrinks during the formation, it puts more stresses on the die. So these are problematic. They have advantages, but the disadvantages, they create higher stresses in the die, and you can get more die cracking. Okay. Okay, so let's go back, oops, sorry, go back here. And, uh, and then again, of course, the, the electrical and thermal properties. The, uh, the glass frit has, uh, does not have very good thermal properties, as you can imagine, because of the glass in there. So you pay a price. The higher temperature stability comes at the cost of poor electrical and thermal performance, whereas these two are much better electrically and thermally, okay? And then there's this new class of materials. I'm not going to talk much about it because that's an entire lecture in itself and we won't have that much time. This is actually material that's now become quite popular. It was started about 10 years ago by a group of people and Professor Pat McCluskey, whose name you keep seeing at the front of every session, I acknowledge him because a lot of these materials are from his presentations. He is one of the original patent holders for different classes. There are many classes of TLPS. He holds a patent on one class of them. Uh, so what these are, are intermetallic compounds. Making them is very, very complicated. That's why you hold patents in them. But these are intermetallic compounds with very, very high melt temperatures. So these are used for extremely high temperatures, but like the glass frit, uh, they're very stiff. So uh, they put the dye at risk. So you have to design dyes to survive uh, d uh, these kind of dye attached materials. But if you have very high, thermal requirement, then this is, these are the materials of choice, okay? All right, let's uh, take a break here, yeah, 11.30, okay. All right. So we're pretty much done talking about dye attached materials. Now let's move on to the next, uh, which would be the uh, wire bonds, okay? so. So part of first level interconnection would be wire bonding. And I apologize for the quality of the graphic here. I just took a small picture and zoomed it in too much, zoomed it out too much, and uh, now it's uh, uh, poor quality. But anyway, you can get the, pic uh, get the uh, picture of what's going on here. So you've got these wire bonds that are interconnecting pads on the die face, active face, to the lead frame. Uh, and there are two technologies here. I uh, haven't spoken about TAB at all yet. TAB is tape automated bonding. I'll come back to that later on. Uh, wire bonding is much more common anyway than tape automated bonding. 
So let's, uh, oh, and, and uh, this is basically showing that not all wire bonds are between the die and the, and the lead frame. Sometimes they're just between metallizations on the substrate itself. So some of them are directly on the substrate, some are from die to substrate. Okay. Okay, and uh, <coughs> the various methods of making wire bonds, we'll talk about that later. Let's first talk about the geometries. So there are two dominant geometries. Uh, one is uh, wedge to wedge, one is uh, ball to wedge. The, in this case, the wedge is called a stitch bond. And uh, this is much more common. The ball bonds account for the majority, uh, well, the ball wedge accounts for the majority of joints. The wedge to wedge is not that common. Uh, well, it's, it's used, but, but for special applications. Uh, so you can, in fact, there's a number over here. About 10% are uh, wedge to wedge, the rest are ball to stitch. Okay. Why bonds, unfortunately, create problems too. Just like every other part of the package, you have to be careful. There's a good way of making wire bonds, bad way of making wire bonds, and they will, no matter how well you make them, they'll still pose some amount of reliability risk. Our job is to minimize it as much as possible. Okay? So you can see what are the various failure modes associated with wire bond failures. So, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about each of these, and then later on in day five, we'll talk more about them. So uh, one of them is wire flexure fatigue. So there the wire itself breaks. So think about what happens here. The, you make the bond by severe deformation of the material over here, right? The material is, so the, the raw material is just a, a thin wire. And then you're forming these shapes with temperature, ultrasonic energy, mechanical force, using or laser, using variety of those different forms of energy. You're locally deforming the material dramatically deforming it, right, into the nonlinear regime, way past its elastic limits, and, uh, uh, and heating up the material locally a lot in order to make those uh, uh, welded joints. So bottom line, there's a heat-affected region over there. If you've studied welding at all, you understand that any time a metal is exposed to that high level of heat, and deformed so dramatic, in this case, not just heated up, but also deformed dramatically at high heat. You're hot working the metal. You create a, a weakened material in that region. So where the transition happens between the heat affected region and the uh, raw wire, the pristine wire, right at that region, that, at that neck, is a weak point in the wire. And most wires that fail snap at that interface between the heat affected zone and the, and the uh, pristine wire region. Same thing in the wedge bond. So you're locally deforming this a lot in order to bond and you're doing that, except you're doing that with uh, ultrasonic energy, okay? So you're locally uh, making the material very deformable and forming that welded joint. Unfortunately, again, that creates a zone, a process zone where the material is full of defects and then there's a transition to the pristine wire. Once again, if there's excessive flexure of this wire, it's gonna snap at that interface. Where does the flexure come from? Well, think about in a plastic package, uh, all of this is embedded in a mold compound. The CT of the mold compound and the CT of the wire are very different. They have different thermal expansions. So each time you heat it up and the mold compound heats up and the wire heats up, the mismatch is taken up as mechanical stresses in the wire. You cool it down, you reverse the stresses, and you keep doing that back and forth, back and forth. You are stretching and uh, shrinking the wire again and again mechanically. And that is what causes flexure fatigue of the wire, okay? Uh, and the reason we're calling it flexure fatigue, all, it's a bit of a misnomer, actually. Part of it is flexure because the wire is changing shape because the mold compound underneath is expanding and cooling. So it looks like the wire is bending, but there's also a lot of stretching of the wire going on at that time because the mold compound and the wire are not expanding by the same amount. So it's a combination, although we call it flexure fatigue, there's a lot of axial stresses involved in that flexure fatigue, stretching uh, forces involved in there. Okay, so that's failure of the wire itself. Then the bond itself can fail. So sometimes instead of the wire failing, it's, it's, it's a, basically it's a chain with multiple sources of defects, the weakest link in the chain is gonna fail. So if you formed a poor quality bond, if that interface is not very strong, then the first thing to fail will not be the wire, but if you keep on pulling on, the, the mold compound keeps on pulling on it repeatedly, 
then uh, instead of the wire failing here, the interface will fail. The bond pad will, uh, the, uh, the bond will, the wire will lift off the bond pad, so that's a wire bond lift off, okay? And again, that can happen either in a wedge bond or in a ball bond. You can have that wire separating out from the uh, bond pad over there. Where it says die, it read that actually as bond pad on the die, because there's a metallization pad on the die, and uh, bond pad is, uh, the wire is bonded on top of that. OK, then bond pad corrosion. Uh, we've talked about that in the past. So the bond pads in the die are exposed in the sense uh, there's no passivation layer on top of them. So they're exposed to the ionic contaminants in the mold compound and moisture that gets in through the mold compound. And eventually, you get corrosion at right on the bond pad over there. So that creates problems. Uh, oh, so I'm sorry. So the axial tension fatigue has been listed separately from flexure fatigue. So the axial tension is the stretching I was talking about because of the mismatch between the mold compound expansion and the wire expansion. The fatigue is a different thing. That is, think about this substrate over here. This has gone from this position in this substrate to that position in that substrate. Well, the substrate itself is shrinking and expanding each time with thermal expansion. And therefore, the wire bond has to uh, unbend and bend to go along with the substrate. And you do that enough number of times that you get bending fatigue, flexure fatigue. Uh, and then cratering. Cratering is, again, a defect that comes from the bonding process and eventually grows into a failure. Uh, what happens there is when you're applying this, and it happens uh, actually more so in ultrasonic bonding, when you're putting pressure over here and energy, you're not only welding and uh, uh, deforming the metal and forming a weld, you're also sending some of that energy into the substrate. And the substrate undergoes damage. So the substrate material immediately under the bond is weakened. And if you don't control your welding parameters correctly, that could be substantial enough that eventually it'll separate over there. And we call that a cratering failure. Uh, actually, I've seen poorly made wire joints, uh, wire bonds where it's cratered right away during the bonding. And in some cases, it didn't fail right away, but eventually failed by cratering. That means you had created defect densities that eventually fail. Okay, intermetallic formation is uh, you're bonding two different metal pieces, and the way you're for bonding it is uh, if you have dissimilar materials. For example, if you have gold wire and aluminum pad, or aluminum wire and gold pad, then you have dissimilar materials. How do dissimilar materials bond? By forming intermetallics. Okay? So there's solid state interdiffusion, and then intermetallics form, and that's how the bond forms. The problem is that at high temperature, the intermetallics keep on growing. So you're continuing to form intermetallic at the interface, and I have to draw this again. Let's reuse some of this paper, save a few trees. OK, so you have bond pad. And I'm intentionally drawing a rough, wavy surface, because if you really zoom in, it's not that flat. Okay, And you've got this wire bond, ball bond that you have joint that you have made. This is all heat-affected region. Okay, And then uh, this is pristine wire. Right here is the neck. That's where a lot of the flexure uh, and axial tension fatigue failures happen. We're talking about this interface now. So let's say this is a gold wire on an aluminum pad. Uh, what you've done is you've formed an intermetallic la layer of intermetallic compounds uh, where the aluminum and the gold have uh, uh, diffused into each other and formed an intermetallic compound, gold aluminum intermetallic compound. Over time, it keeps scavenging more ions from both sides, and that intermetallic continues to grow. But the problem is that the interdiffusion of gold into aluminum is not the same rate as aluminum into gold. So there's a preferential flow of ions, and you're getting pores forming on one side, depletion, and excess metal on the other side. So eventually what happens is you're left behind with a high density of pores below the intermetallic layer in the pad. and uh, that eventually fractures out. So excessive intermetallic growth is a problem because of that pore formation. There's a name for it. We call it Kirkendall voiding. Some of you may have heard that name. 
I can never remember if there's an H over there. There may or may not be an H. Okay. So that's what we are referring to in this slide as intermetallic formation. So yes. What are the, your your main formation of aluminum to gold? Or gold to aluminum. Uh, anytime you have two different metals which have dissimilar interdiffusion rates, intermetallic formation is a problem. But when you say the pad is uh, gold and the oh. Good question. So let's let's try to remember it. So I think uh, it's this way. When the pad is aluminum and the wire is gold, then you get Kirkendall voiding in the pad because aluminum diffuses faster into gold than the other way around. Uh, when it's the opposite, when this is gold and that is aluminum, you form a weakened region over there, a depletion region over there in the, in the, uh, on the wire side of the interface, okay. or the ball side of the interface. OK, um, dendritic growth. So th this is not a huge problem in wire bonds. We talked about dendritic. I showed you some pictures of dendritic growth in ceramic capacitors and batteries and so on. It's not a huge problem in wire bonds, but some people have reported growth of dendrites, uh, especially between when you have dissimilar metals uh, across the metallizations locally forming dendrites over there. It's not generally not a huge problem for wire bonds. OK, wire sweep is actually a kind of a vague term. What, what it's referring to is what I talked about earlier during the molding process. You've got flow of very thick mold compound, plastic mold compound, uh, flowing past the wires, and by drag, creating forces on the wire. And that causes damage both to the wire, especially at the neck, and also to the bond itself. So that is what we usually refer to as uh, wire sweep problems. And the way people minimize that is by designing the sweep of the, the profile or the sweep of that wire. They try to optimize that to try to minimize the amount of drag resistance. And that's where that term wire sweep comes from. OK. OK. Um, so this uh, wire, uh, whatever we have mm -hmm. the band, uh, it's just to minimize your, uh, the issues? Or so OK. So here's, here's the thing. Uh, that sweep, think of it almost as a strain relief. Now, if there's an expansion over here, that loop gives me strain relief. Of course, it creates now flexure of the wire. That's a problem. But if I didn't create that, if I had a straight wire, then each time this substrate expanded, it would put a lot of shear stress onto the, uh, into the bonds, at the bonding interface, and tension in the wire. So this acts like a strain relief. But the flip side of it is bigger that strain relief bigger the problem due to the sweeping of the mold compound. So you have to optimize between these uh, two problems. Uh, that's what the wire sweep is referring to. Okay. So but what, what you say is it is going to increase your particular it's, it's not going to eliminate it, but you have to minimize it so you get more life out of the product. Right? You're extending the life of the product. OK. Um, all right. So uh, the kinds of materials that you need to make these wires, uh, bonded wire connections, are strong, ductile materials, fatigue resistant, right? Those are all the necessities. Uh, it needs the right melting properties, because especially the ball bond, it actually forms a molten. You actually melt the material over there when it's not with ultrasonic, but when it's done with uh, a heat source, you actually melt and form a ball over there, which you then bond over there. So the melting temperature is very important. So the melt characteristics are important. The hardness is important because if it's a very hard material, you're not going to be able to deform it locally there to form a bond very easily with ultrasonic energy. So the hardness is important. Corrosion is important because it's an intimate contact with uh, uh, ionic contaminants in the mold compound, so it should not corrode. So corrosion property is important. That's one of the reasons gold is important because gold has uh, good properties for all of these, right? Intermetallic formation, I just talked about that fact. So on the one hand, you do want to form some intermetallic. Otherwise, you're not going to form a joint very well over there, right? It, uh, the joint has to form by making intermetallics. So it must be able to form some intermetallics, but not too much. If, it's, if the interdiffusion is too much, then form too much intermetallic, then you leave behind voids. Ah, so there's, it's two L's and no H, my mistake. Uh, 
and uh, that creates, so that's excessive inner metallic formation, okay? And then we had just talked about the wire sweep issue, so that's not really a material consideration. Uh, it becomes a material consideration in that its flexure fatigue properties should be strong enough, okay? So the kinds of, there are three choices of materials. They're either gold-based, or to save cost, you go aluminum-based, or nowadays, more and more extensively, we're using copper because it has better thermal properties than, uh, electrical and thermal properties than aluminum. Uh, so the gold, of course, is not pure gold. It's alloyed with either copper or with beryllium. And the aluminum is uh, uh, microalloyed either with silicon or with magnesium, okay? The copper is also alloyed, but very, very small co uh, contents, usually a little bit of zirconium and a very small percentage of zirconium or a few other trace metals, okay? So those are the materials of choice, usually, okay? And what's missing over here, I really apologize. For some reason, the electrical and uh, thermal properties <laughs> have not been listed. Uh, the electrical properties are very important. This is not a main pathway for uh, heat transfer. So the thermal properties are not that important other than the melt temperature and the thermal expansion coefficient. That's also not been listed here, thermal expansion coefficient. Uh, but certainly uh, the electrical properties are very important, right? Okay, so here are some uh, typical properties. And I apologize, I just realized this morning that some of the values given in that table were wrong. I've corrected the ones that I could catch this morning between <laughs> other urgencies I did correct. But for example, I think the uh, Young's modulus for aluminum is listed wrong. It's listed as 35 GPA. It's more like aluminum is more like 70 GPA, okay? Then also I found uh, the CT I think was listed incorrectly. Those are the two that I corrected. Let me check. Yep, CT was also listed as 45, 46. It's closer to 20, okay? So I apologize, there were two errors in that slide. Okay, but again, this is just data. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with it, but you can see that uh, 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 the thermal conductivities are different, the specific heats are different, uh, melting points, there's very, a lot of difference, right? Melting point is super important. Uh, then uh, electrical properties, you can see uh, aluminum and gold are here, and this is copper, okay? Uh, and then uh, elastic modulus, quite different. Gold and aluminum are somewhat in the same range. Copper is much higher. Whoops, wait a minute, what happened here? 70. <laughs> uh, this is also wrong, I apologize. Copper is more like... Uh, 10 to the power 11, 1.32 uh, 10 to the power 11. So that's also wrong. I'll have to change that. I'll, I'll send you an updated version, okay? 1.32. Gold is about 70 GPA, yes. 70 to 80 GPA. That's a, we're talking about the stiffness, not the strength. Strength is down here, right? Stiffness, uh, I think gold is more uh, than your copper, right? No, 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 no. Not the copper alloys we're talking about. This is not pure copper. These are copper alloys. It's copper, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then CT-wise, uh, aluminum is much higher. Copper and gold are closer to each other, okay? Okay, let's, uh, oh, and hardness. Hardness, unfortunately, copper is quite a bit harder. So that's a disadvantage of copper. Hardness is extremely important when doing ultrasonic welding, uh, bonding, and copper is unfortunately higher. So, for example, you would never be able to make copper bonds, bond wires on aluminum pads. You have to have copper pads to make copper, uh, to bond copper wire. Otherwise, you destroy the aluminum pad. Copper is much, much harder than aluminum, okay? Okay. All right, so the shapes we already talked about. This is a ball wedge bond. This is a wedge wedge bond, okay? So this second wedge is often called a stitch bond, but uh, basically it is a, a wedge bond, the second one. So usually what happens is you form this one first, so the wire gets fed on top of uh, 
uh, on top of this. If it's a thermal process on this pad, you actually melt the solder at the end and uh, it forms a bead and then you touch that bead onto the pad. There's, uh, it's already liquid form, so it bonds very easily. There's liquid state inner diffusion, intermetallics form, and it bonds. And then you retract the wire and you come down onto the second pad and you make the wedge bond. Okay? So that's typically how that happens. And this one is uh, you come down on one pad, make the first wedge bond, and then feed the wire out onto the second one, make the second wedge bond, then you chop off the wire. Same thing here, you chop off the wire. This is super fast. They go zoop, 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 uh, about 10 bonds a second, uh, that kind of a speed. Okay? Obviously, highly automated. They typically use wedge to wedge bonds? No, the ball to wedge is much more ball common. Ball. Yeah. Uh, about 80 to 90 percent of the time it's this configuration, 10 to 20 percent of the time it's this configuration. Uh, it's just manufacturability, much easier. And uh, this one is used much more in power electronics. So, so where the uh, wires are much thicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the wires are much thicker over there. OK. Um, so here are the processes. You can do a thermal bonding, right? That's where you heat up the ball. Uh, to a, almost to a liquid stage, not fully liquid, but almost to a liquid stage, and uh, then you uh, touch it down on the pad and it bonds over there. So uh, very common for the gold wedge bond, uh, gold ball bonds. Okay, uh, and it's a combination of uh, ultrasonic energy and thermal energy, uh, and then some are there's no thermal at all, just pure ultrasonic. But it's interesting, just ultrasonic energy can soften the material just as heating it can soften. And I'll show you a little bit of data that from the literature that ultrasonic soft, uh, apparently softens the material a lot. So basically what you're doing is sending high frequency vibrational energy, sending phonons. The energy is coming from phonons rather than from uh, uh, just heating it up. So these are, you're creating from vibration, you're creating phonons, and uh, that's what's forming the wedge bar. Okay. Um, so here's, here's the process. You can see that you come down, you feed this through this uh, bonding tool, you feed this uh, wire, and you heat up the end, okay? You heat it with a laser or thermosonic methods. You form that bead. You touch that bead down, the ball bond forms, and then this tool retracts and goes over to the next pad, and then you form a wedge bond, and then you chop off the wire at the tip, and that's the end of it, okay? And the whole thing is completely automated, okay? It moves fast. Okay, um, so yeah, so there's the speed. About you form about ten uh, bonds per second, roughly, on a on a uh, production type machine. Okay. Okay. Um, ultrasonic is there's no you're not changing the temperature. Okay, you're not applying a heat source. You're just using uh, uh, ultrasound energy to to uh, soften the material there. Okay, um, so uh, mostly thick aluminum wires, wedge wedge bonds in power electronics, uh, thick aluminum wires, those are ultrasonically bonded. Uh, and uh, you can see ultrasonic bond, uh, bonding has had some controversy over the years. Some people say it locally does heat up, some people say it doesn't, and there are studies that claim either side. But there are certainly enough studies that, that uh, have measured and shown that ultrasonic wedge bonding does not create local hot spots over there. The, the temperature <coughs> apparently still remains low. There is uh, phonons created from vibrational energy, but it's apparently not changing the uh, observable temperature of the material over there. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. However, the material stress-strain curves soften a lot under ultrasonic just as it does in uh, due to high temperature. So it has the same effect on the material as high temperature. It softens the stress strain curves. I'll show you in a minute, OK? Uh, all right, so the interface, because it's all solid state, there's no melting over there, there's less inner diffusion and less inner metallics that form, OK? All right, um, let's, uh, OK, this is the slide I was looking for. So this is a study done uh, pretty early on, 1966, which is quite an old study. Uh, you can see stress strain curves of aluminum, one at different temperatures, 
room temperature 18 degrees C all the way up to 600 degrees C, you can see the material softening. That means the yield strength is dropping lower and lower and lower, okay? Uh, versus ultrasonic energy, same temperature. All the tests are done at room temperature 18 degrees C, but with more and more and more of ultrasonic energy, the effect of stress strain curves are softening just as it does under temperature. So interestingly, the phonons that come from ultrasound energy are playing the, having the same effect on the material <coughs> mechanical deformation that temperature does. Okay. Okay. Here are some wedge wedge bonds, for example, copper wedge wedge bonds in some power electronic devices. Okay. Uh, these are basically connecting IGBTs and uh, bus bars. So here, wedge bonds are quite common. Okay. So copper. So this is not gold, this is not aluminum. Now we're talking copper wires, which have become quite popular. Uh, and you can get pretty good bonds if you bond them on copper pads. If you try bonding on aluminum pads, you're going to destroy the pad because of the difference in hardness. But copper to copper, you can get pretty good uh, bonding. The bond quality is definitely acceptable. It says so clearly here that you cannot bond to aluminum. You'd crush the bond pad and then crack the silicon underneath that crushed bond pad. The uh, reason copper is, well, several reasons, but one of the reasons copper is popular, we talked about that yesterday. Uh, it has obviously much better electrical characteristics, 40% lower electrical resistivity, and that's what allows it to carry, and, and better, uh, higher melt temperature, so you can carry much more power through these much more easily. Okay? Uh, better heat transfer, better CT match to silicon than aluminum, uh, and then... Uh, uh, does not change properties. So it, at high temperatures, uh, aluminum unfortunately loses all its hardness. Copper does, but not as much as aluminum. Okay? And that overall, these changes lead to better performance, better reliability. Okay. Um, so here are some examples of failures. I talked about several of these already. So you can see this is the neck where your trans uh, so this is you're looking downwards onto a ball bond okay and uh, this is the wire that's come out of it this is all heat affected material and this is pristine material and this is where the transition is from uh, pristine properties to heat affected properties and that interface becomes weak and that's where fatigue failures happen for bond wires as opposed to that sometimes the failures are in the bond itself the bonding interface and this is a wedge bond. You can see that uh, it's separated from the, from the rest of the structure. It's uh, failed over there. Okay. All right. Uh, we talked about excessive intermetallic formation and failures. So here's a good bond as bonded without any further aging. So uh, this is the gold ball. This is the aluminum pad. Locally, it's deformed, formed into metallics, and you've uh, formed a joint. But as time goes on, if you keep heating it, so these were, uh, uh, we did some, not we, the people who did this study did some accelerated aging on them, 750 hours at 185 degrees C, and you've grown the intermetallic layer a lot. It's, the intermetallic layer is barely visible here. It's right at that interface, and you've grown that in intermetallic a lot, and you've left behind voids down in the aluminum pad here, and that's weak in the joint. <coughs> So the failure side there is always at that uh, bond pad interface, OK? All right, so as time goes on, as you grow more intermetallic, initially you see that as change in electrical resistance. And ultimately, you start to, because of the pores that are forming, you start to fail that joint. That leads to intermittent opens and ultimately just a steady open, OK? OK. Um, all right, so that's, that's all I wanted to say about wire bonds. The next is a different bonding. So we'll talk about two other bonding technologies. One will be TAD, tape automated bonding. The other will be flip chip solder bonding, which is the other third level one interconnection method. Okay? So these are all level one interconnection methods, meaning you're interconnecting the die to the rest of the package. Okay, so the TAD process is still a form of wire bonding, but it's a much more automated process. So the wire bonds, the wires come, it's not a single wire, it com comes pre-printed onto ribbons like these. So you can see these are ribbons with sprockets. It's reel-to-reel -reel operation. So depending on what your die looks like, 
you uh, design these tabs and you manufacture these tabs for your die with the right layout, wire layout that your uh, die needs. And uh, now you can start, you place uh, your dies underneath, you place your tab on top, you gang bond. That means you bond all the joints at the same time, not one joint at a time. So the throughput is much higher, okay? So uh, all, the, all the bonds are made at the same time with a complex bonding tool. And then you bond the, so that's the inner, we call that the inner lead bonding. And then later on, you do the outer lead bonding. Again, all of them at the same time. All the outer leads are bonded at the same time. Uh, so uh, in order to do that, you have to prepare the die. So the wafer, and that's done at the wafer level. It's not done after singulation. It's prepared for tab bonding while it's still in the wafer. Okay, so it's a wafer level process. Uh, so done before the dicing. And you create gold bumps on the bond pads of your die because you need those gold bumps so you can do the gang bonding of the tab onto it. Okay, so uh, so that so you do that gold bumping at the wafer level. Then you dice them into individual dies. Then you place this tab film or roll uh, over the die uh, with a pick and place uh, uh, registration. Okay, that has to be aligned to the right accuracy. And then you bond the inner leads. Then you do your testing, encapsulation, uh, single, uh, uh, cut off the film, so that's the singulation process. Then you test, and then finally, you do the outer lead bonding. So that's the eight step process for TAB. And I'll show you a couple of different uh, uh, images of those intermediate steps, not all of them. So here's gold bumping, for example. That's the, fir sorry. That's the first step, the wafer, it's done at the wafer level. So these are the pads on the die, and you create these gold bumps directly onto those aluminum pads on the. So this is not copper metallization. This example is uh, <coughs> aluminum metallization on the die. And that's your bond pad. So uh, you have to create, build these gold pads. So you create first uh, under bump metallurgy. OK, so that consists of a bunch of different barrier metals because you don't want the gold and the aluminum uh, interdiffusing too much between them. OK, so you put down a few very small thickness uh, angstroms of barrier metals and adhesion metals, and then you go build a gold bump on top of that with a photoresist, okay, just like uh, we talked about yesterday, the various photoresist methods, and you deposit the gold and uh, then planarize it. So bump metals most commonly are gold, but sometimes people use copper and solder, so especially if your metallization is copper, the bumps will be copper. Uh, and, as, and if your tab wires are gonna be copper, it must be copper. You cannot bond copper tabs onto gold uh, pads. You have to put them on copper pads, okay? Uh, okay, so the, here are the details of the process. I'm really not gonna go through all the details. You can read that later on. Uh, uh, so it's in nanometers, actually, not, not angstroms, nanometers. Uh, I was trying to look for the thickness of the barrier layers. It's in uh, uh, nanometers, okay? Okay, um, then comes, uh, okay, so this is still uh, the wafer bumping. It's just illustrating that once you've formed that bump, the, what you then do is uh, tab, uh, uh, this is the inner, lead, inner end of the tab lead. So go back here and look at it. That's the inner end of the tab lead. So you face, uh, place that tab on top of the uh, gold, uh, on top of the die, so that the pads on the tab and the pad on the bump line, uh, the bump on the, and the bump on the die line up, and that then you do the bonding process, apply the thermosonic or ultrasonic energy and do the bonding. Uh, so here is now the gang bonding. So you used what's called a thermode, okay? That's the inner lead bonding process. So here's your chip that's been singulated. It, you formed the bump, bumps on the wafer, then you singulated the chip. Now you align the tab on top of that chip, bump to pad, and now you bond all of them together, bring down this uh, uh, hot uh, bonding tool, and bond all of them together, okay? So the choices there are, again, either thermal compression or sometimes laser bonding, not done that commonly, but sometimes. And in a few cases, if these are solder bumps, then they use hot gas for bonding those, okay? All right, 
Those stab leads, by the way, uh, forgot. These are called fingers. Okay, so these these stab leads are called fingers. So you do the inner lead bonding of those fingers, and then you do the outer lead bonding of those fingers. Okay, so now let's move on. Uh, uh, that's so. These are some images of those inner lead. So this is the bump that was formed on the die. This is the uh, inner end of that finger on the tab, and you can see bumps that have formed over there. Okay. All right. Yes, tabs are straight, yes. So there's a CT issue. So they're not used that commonly. There are, there are other challenges in tabs, and that's partly why it gained that much popularity. Although the, it was, the process was invented back in, I don't know, late 70s, uh, 80s, that kind of time frame. Uh, the problem is that, uh, and, and from a manufacturability point of view, you can see the attraction. It's uh, all of them bonded at the same time. It's a very highly automated process. But uh, from a reliability perspective, it has its own challenges. There's no stress relief. Uh, people have tried to make 3D tab profiles. That gets very complicated. One more thing is also you can't use the photo Ah, so yes, yes. So just perimeter leaded, you can make do. But if you have multiple rows of, especially when you get to die stacks, it gets very complicated. OK, uh, so now you've formed the inner lead bond. You still, you still have the tape over it, right? These are the sprockets of the tape. It's still in the tape uh, scenario. You have not cut off, uh, you've not singulated yet. The singulation will be done there and there, OK? Uh, so it's usually molded at this stage. So here is a full encapsulation versus sometimes you just mold one side of it, and the back side remains still exposed. Uh, but the point is, you do the encapsulation, and then you, uh, after that, you do uh, cut off the cut off the rest of the roll over there, of that uh, ribbon, and you're left with singulated chips with tab bonds, inner bonds. Okay, then you take those to your test setup. You do a test to see if the bonding is correct, if everything's working fine, and then you do the final uh, uh, outer lead bonding. Okay, so these are just test uh, sockets to uh, test for functionality. And then finally, again, you do gang bonding. This time, the, th uh, the electrode is now pressing down on the outer leads as opposed to the inner leads of the fingers. Okay, so you uh, bond the outer leads over there. Now, this one is an interesting one. It's not flat. This is actually 3D. So that's a special example. It's not that common. OK. All right, so uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you can uh, make do with much smaller pads. It turns out those bumps that you make are very tiny. OK. You can also get to smaller pitches than you would in a conventional wire bond. OK. Uh, uh, I'm not sure how they make that statement, decreasing the quantity of gold used. I'm not sure where that comes from. But, uh, but that's listed as one of the advantages, OK? Uh, uh, it's a, because it's a highly automated process, there's less variation in geometry and quality. It's a, a dramatically increased production rate because of the gang bonding, OK? And uh, uh, in general, if, if your production parameters are correct, if your fabrication parameters are set right, then you get much more uniformity, less piece-to-piece -piece variability and much more uniformity in the bond strength, OK? OK, uh, and that, of course, higher throughput. Because of this uh, higher production rate, it means higher throughput, which means lower costs. And, and the lower pitch, finer pitch, means higher I.O. counts. So all of those advantages, OK? Disadvantages is uh, just like any automated process, you need tooling. You need custom tooling for every die design. So the tooling cost has to be added in. So for small production runs, you would not do tape, uh, tab. Uh, but for high volume, it's worth considering. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, third one is uh, what's our next break? One o'clock. Okay. So we have time. The third uh, bonding technique. So wire bonding, tab, and now the third and final one we'll look at is flip chip bonding. So in both the previous ones, oh, actually the my picture is in the next. Let's go to this picture.
in both the previous ones we've talked about, wire bonding and tab bonding, the die is face up. That means the active surface of the die is facing upwards. Flip chip bonding is the opposite. The active surface is on the bottom, or rather you take the die active surface and flip it over, hence the term flip chip. You flip the chip over, face down, or face towards the printed circuit board or whatever substrate you're going to uh, mount it on. Uh, and you're matching pads, array of pads on the substrate, uh, matching with the pads and solder balls on the chip. And it's an area array uh, uh, concept, as you can see. And then these uh, pads have solder balls on them. And you would then place it and solder them together in a reflow oven. Uh, that's after soldering. You can see that you form these solder joints. So this is the subst multi-layer substrate. That's the chip. And you formed solder joints between them. So let's. Uh, so these are area array packages, uh, pack uh, area array chips. So obviously, when you have very high number of IOs, then you go to area array because there's not enough space in the perimeters to make just perimeter uh, d uh, pads. So you need entire face, a 2D array of pads, to accommodate all the IOs for the die size that you have. Uh, uh, the bumped die basically means that you form solder bumps on those pads on the die. So you do the bumping on the die. Typically, that's done at the wafer level. So while the die is still in the wafer, you'd form all the bumps. Then you would singulate. And then you take each of these bumped single dies and uh, flip them onto the package substrate and solder them together. OK. okay. Uh, here's where the temperature hierarchy comes. Typically, these are done with high melting point temperature uh, solders. Why? Because this package is then going to go through a second round of soldering onto the circuit board. This is just first level. I'm still packaging. I mean, I'm still putting this inside the package, right? I'm soldering it inside the package. Now this package has to be soldered onto a circuit card, the second round of soldering. If I use the same solder for both levels, that means same solder for this soldering and for soldering down to the board, when I go through my second reflow, all of these are going to melt. Can't have that, right? So you don't want these joints to melt. So the first level always uses a higher melt temperature solder than the second level. Uh, then there are examples where there is no package. You put the die directly onto the circuit card. It's called flip chip on board. There you have eliminated one level. And there, of course, you have just one set of solder joints. They're all going through the reflow together. There you can use any solder you want. But packages like these, where you have one set of solder joints inside the package and another set of solder joints outside the package, you have to have a melting temperature hierarchy. OK, okay and I'll come back to that uh, later on. There's a whole slide devoted just to temperature hierarchy. <coughs> OK, uh, so wh why flip chip bonding? Uh, one is, of course, you get much more uh, uh, I.O. count, higher density, because it's area array. You cannot do wire bonding. Well, it's very hard to do wire bonding in area array, and you certainly cannot do tab in area yeah, array. Uh, the wire bonding is at least like three rows. Up to three, yeah, whereas this is completely over the whole area. You can make uh, joints. But more important than that, wire bonds have length, especially if you have over the area, then you're talking about some very long wires, and now you're talking about a lot of electrical losses. So a lot of parasitic electrical problems, especially for high-frequency circuits, it's just not feasible. Uh, these are direct contact. Look at this over here. Your interconnect length is the height of that solder joint. That's all. And then you're directly into the substrate uh, interconnected there. So the interconnect length, the effective interconnect length is much, much shorter than wire bonds or tab fingers. And that gives a tremendous electrical advantage for high frequency circuits. So that's really the main, if you talk to electrical designers, that's the main reason why they go to uh, 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 flip chip bonding. Thank you. OK, there's also some thermal advantages, packaging related advantages. Because think about it. Now you've got the die phase down over here, and that entire back surface of the die is now available to you to remove heat. So not only are you removing heat through the solder joints into the substrate, you can now start to do some fancy cooling on the back side of it. I don't have access to this side. Of, I mean, I've, the only access for cooling here I have is through the die attached at the bottom. I, I've got all kinds of active circuitry on top. I cannot play around with uh, trying to cool through that surface. And I've got wire bonds and everything. I'd damage all of that if I tried any fancy cooling on that surface. 
Whereas here, this is the back surface. There's nothing on it. I can put heat sinks on it. I can uh, do microchanneling, uh, liquid cooling on it. I can do all kinds of fancy stuff over there. Okay, so that's a tremendous thermal advantage when you have a, uh, high power chips that are flip chip bonded. You can do direct on chip cooling. And if you look at some of your CPUs and all, they have very fancy heat sinks and all that you can put directly onto onto the back of the chip. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, of course, it's attributed directly to uh, IBM. They, they are the people who first started FlipChip. They called it the C4 technology, CCCC, Controlled Collapse Chip Connection, 4C, C4 technology. But uh, theirs was a very expensive process. They would be putting these down on ceramic substrates. Why? Because uh, you have to match CTEs, right? Think about it. Uh, you've got silicon with three to four parts per million. If this substrate is a traditional organic substrate or like a metal lead frame, uh, the CT mismatch is humongous. So IBM started to make ceramic substrates and putting these silicon dyes on ceramic substrates so the CT match so the solder joints don't see a lot of stress due to thermal expansion mismatches. Okay. Uh, so we've come a long way since then. Now, of course, like I told you, we put silicon dyes directly on printed wiring boards. So printed wiring boards have thermal expansion, and I'll be talking a lot more about this in day five. Printed wiring boards have in-plane thermal expansion of about 17 to 20 parts per million. The dye is only four parts per million. You've got humongous thermal expansion mismatch. How do you make that little itty bitty solder joint survive that kind of a mismatch? Take some work, okay, we'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, IBM did not have any of that problem. They were just intentionally mounting these directly on ceramic substrates. Very expensive, but that's, what, uh, that's how they first started this technology. Okay. All right, um, and they were also using uh, high lead solders because remember, these have to be higher temperature solders than conventional solders, the level two solders. So they were using high lead solders also for high enough temperature. So there's a lot of... Uh, uh, technology to this. It's, it's, it's uh, not just direct solder on, on the uh, dye pad. You need barrier layers in between so the solder doesn't interdiffuse with the dye metallization. So you need uh, adhesion layers, you need barrier layers. So that whole complex layers of materials on that bump, on that, uh, on that pad, uh, bond pad, is uh, called, broadly called UBM, under bump metallization also called BLM. BLM is uh, ball limiting metallization. Okay, we'll talk more about that soon. But the point is that there's a lot of engineering that has gone into making this technology. You can't just put a solder on a bump and expect it to work. You need to have all the right adhesion, barrier, everything in between. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is where I'll talk a little bit about the CT mismatch, and that's why IBM was putting it on ceramic substrate. So I already discussed it with hand waving. This is just a figure that uh, says the same thing. So here's a ceramic substrate. This is much better CT matched to uh, silicon. Silicon is three to four. This is about six to seven, okay? And think about the expansion mismatch, okay? Uh, the mismatch is the uh, think about this last joint over here, okay? Uh, uh, the distance from the center to that last joint is called distance from neutral point, so that's DNP, okay? So the distance from here to the center of the last joint is this DNP. And delta T is the temperature change that we are going to have. We're going to raise this whole assembly up by, let's say, 50 degrees C, and now you have thermal expansion mismatch, so that is 50 degrees C. Delta alpha is the CT mismatch. So in this case, the CT mismatch is only 3.7. But if this was conventional circuit card material, 17, the CT mismatch would be 14. Delta alpha would have been 14. And H is the height of the solder joint. Okay? So this is not a very sophisticated calculation, but it's a reasonably good first order calculation of how much shear deformation the solder joint has to go through. And I can draw a very simple figure for that. I'll represent the, I'll just join, draw the corner solder joint, and I'll represent that instead of a ball with a rectangle, 
Okay, so that's a solder ball, a solder bump actually. So this is expanding by alpha one delta t, which is three times fifty, let's say, because I'm making delta p fifty. This is expanding by alpha two delta t. So that is, and the difference of the two, so the difference in expansion, this has expanded by a certain amount relative to the center, okay? Both sides have expanded. This has expanded a different amount, so this point here has moved here, and now the solder joint has to do that because it's still connected. So that's the shear deformation we're talking about in the solder. So this is a shear deformation. And that shear strain, this angle is the shear strain, and that shear strain, delta gamma, is the difference of the two expansions. So the expansion here is L times alpha 1 delta t, L1 alpha delta t minus alpha 1 delta t, minus second one has gone L2, L, same L, but alpha 2 delta t, and then divide by the height to get that angle, divide by h, that gives you that strain. Okay? So this is L. D alpha 1 minus alpha 2, delta alpha, and delta t divided by h. So if you go back to the slide, that's the equation you see over there. Sorry. Okay. That's, that's the equation you see over there. L, delta alpha, delta t, divided by h. That's the shear strain. And now as you heat and cool, you're repeating the delta gamma in both directions, plus minus shear. You're fatiguing the solder, and that's why it fails. Okay. So that's why I've been put it on CT matched substrates, but nowadays we have the technology to do it with uh, unmatched substrates also. Uh, in a real application, the mm -hmm. delta T's will be different as a silicon versus a So yes, so again, this is a very simplified example. Typically, this will be T1, this will be, well, delta T1, delta T2, because the chip is running usually at a higher temperature, yeah. Uh, then there are examples where if the chip is cooled on the backside, then sometimes those uh, mismatches are not that huge. Right. Okay. Uh, so here's the technology you need to make it survive when the uh, CTs are not matched. So uh, th these bumps are seeing enormous amounts of shear strains. So what you're doing now is putting this underfill that is acting as a set of springs in parallel to the solders. Okay or set of reinforcements in parallel with the solder, so the load's getting distributed now. Part of it is being borne by the solder, part of it is being borne by the underfill, and now the solder is carrying less load and therefore can survive longer. What it does do, though, is it creates a stiffer interconnection, so there's more stresses in the chip now. So if you put in a very stiff underfill, the solder joint will live forever, but the chip is going to fail, fatigue crack. So once again, it's a system level optimization. You want to trade off between solder joint ruggedization and chip uh, vulnerability, fragility, and you want to make sure that they both fail at about the same time and not one before the other. Uh, so the underfill is a very complicated material because it has to play a lot of roles. It has to remove heat. It must not change the electrical performance, so the dielectric constants of the underfill will change the uh, ele effective electrical uh, performance at that interface, okay? So the dielectric constants are important. The stiffness is important, as I said. A very compliant underfill doesn't do anything. The solder joint is still going to fail. A very stiff underfill is very kind to the solder, but very cruel to the die. So you don't want a very stiff underfill. You want something in between. The CT of the underfill is important. Why? Because remember, the underfill doesn't just expand. Well, underfill is also going to expand, I'm sorry. Uh, but it expands not only in the horizontal direction, it also expands in the vertical direction. So if it is not matched to the solder in the vertical direction, think about, let's take a case where the underfill CT is higher than the solder. When you heat it up, the underfill is pushing up on the chip, and now the solder is not shearing, but it's in tensile fatigue now. And that's even worse than shear fatigue. Okay? So on the other hand, if the underfill has lower CT than solder, then when you heat it, it's compressing the solder. That's not a bad thing. But when you're cooling it, it's stretching the solder. So either way, it's a problem. Okay? So you want to match it closely to the CT of the solder. But now you've got this material that's close to CT of the solder in intimate contact with the chip. And now you have an in-plane mismatch. The CT wants to expand 3 parts per million. The underfill wants to expand horizontally 20 parts per million, like solder. 
and that interface can delaminate. And uh, uh, once you have delaminated the underfill, it can no longer act as an effective load-carrying member. Okay. Uh, so, and then okay. So that's the CT. Then the adhesion characteristics of the underfill. You want something that has good bonding, good adhesion to the silicon nitride passivation layer on that side, and the solder mask on this side. If either of those interfaces is weak, eventually the underfill will delaminate, and it doesn't carry load anymore, doesn't perform its function. Its moisture absorption property is important. It's a polymer. It's going to absorb moisture, and that moisture is eventually going to get trapped in. There will be some amount of delamination always, and that moisture will get trapped in those delaminated regions over here. And remember, this is solder. So soldering is often done with some amount of flux. Okay? And that leaves behind some amount of residues because you can only clean so well under a flip chip. Remember, these joints are very tiny. This is flip chip joints are barely 60 microns high to less than that. There are some micro joints that are 20 microns high. How do you clean under a chip that only has a 20 micron clearance? So you're left behind with some flux residues which are highly uh, corrosive. Okay? I mean, we do make better fluxes now that are less corrosive, but there's still some amount of corrosive ability. So now when moisture gets in, gets absorbed in there, it activates those uh, corrosive mechanisms, and you get corrosion problems at the bond pads near the solder joints. So not only that, once it absorbs moisture, its effective dielectric constants have changed. And these are dielectrically matched so that, or tuned so that they don't change the, because the whole point of going to these kinds of joints was to change the electrical characteristics to remove, uh, minimize parasitic losses in high frequency circuits. Well, now with moisture in that underfill, you've changed the dielectric properties and again, you've created problems. Okay. So it's a very complex, multi physics, multi dimensional problem choice of underfills. So, underfill technology is very complex. Last but not least is the rheology of this. Because there are two ways, under, and we'll go through some slides, there are two ways underfills are made. One of them is you feed it from one side and it flows by capillary action under the entire dye. Well, the flow characteristics are extremely important. So the rheology has to be just right, otherwise it won't flow. It'll cure before it reaches the other end and you'll be left or leave behind big voids. So if you think about the footprint of it, I, let me see if I have a picture with a footprint. Yeah. So think about the footprint of it. If the underfill is flowing through one side, each bump is an obstacle. It has to flow around the obstacle. Well, if the rheology is not right, what it does is it leaves behind then voids in the wake. Sometimes it's a complete void. Sometimes it's not a void. The fluid fills it. But remember, these are not just <coughs> fluids. They are just polymers. These are filled polymers because I'm trying to control their CTE. I'm trying to control their stiffness. And I'm trying to control the dielectric properties. So I put in special fillers. Uh, sometimes for the mechanical properties, we put in uh, uh, silicate or uh, uh, silica or barium titanate kinds of fillers. And then to control electrical pro dielectric properties also, we have to put in some specific kinds of fillers. But the point is these are, uh, let me see if I have a cross section of underfill so you can see the fillers. So it's a complex, uh, there. It's a very complicated uh, uh, composite. So it's polymers with all these fillers. Sometimes the fillers are spherical, sometimes they're flakes. Depends on what kind of underfill you're buying. But the point is, if these pitches are in very uh, uh, fine pitch bumps, they almost act like a sieve. That means the fillers start to clog up over there. The fluid goes through, <coughs> fillers clog up. So in the wake of the bumps, you've got pure resin with no filler. And now you've got localized heterogeneities of undesirable properties. Poor CT, poor stiffness. Uh, poor uh, dielectric properties and so on, and poor moisture, uh, uh, moisture expansion. Okay? Viscosity, Viscosity also is extreme. The rheology is extremely important. So, uh, uh, and, and not just that, it, has to, it takes a finite amount of time for the capillary flow. During that period, the viscosity has to be just right. Uh, then comes, the vis there's another effect of viscosity. Think about these filler particles. And I'm saying all of this from personal experience. Qu your friend Krishna and I have done a lot of studies on these systems when he was a graduate student. And we've actually physically seen all these problems. Uh, the density of particles in the vertical direction is uh, not uniform. 
if the viscosity is not right. The particles settle by gravity, and you're left behind with a material where all the particles are concentrated at the bottom, and it's closer to pure resin on the top. Again, you have a gr unwanted gradation of properties in the thickness direction. So all of these are very complex process and performance interactions that you have to be very, very careful. So not all underfilts are created equal. For underfilts, you must go to people who understand polymers. You can't just buy something off the shelf. It's, uh, you've got to go to reputable people. And even reputable people, uh, the reason I mentioned Krishna is because we were doing these studies back in the mid-1990s. Uh, not mid, mid to late 1990s. And back then, underfill technology was still rather rudimentary. It's come a long, long, long way since then. And people didn't understand underfills that well at that time. And we were getting underfills from the most reputable companies back then and still seeing all these problems. We are seeing the wake formation behind the bump, shadowing behind the bump. We are seeing voids due to incomplete filling because of bad rheology. We were seeing settling of particles due to gravity because of wrong rheology. Uh, all kinds of problems. And it took several iterations for these manufacturers, or these uh, underfilled manufacturers, to get it right. So you took how much material uh, patented? Oh, very, yes, very much so, very much so. Uh, these are highly patented. These are trade secrets. Every underfilled manufacturer has their own secret sauce, and they won't tell you what's in it. Yeah. yeah. These, these should have non-Newtonian characteristics. Uh, highly. These are not pixotropic. These are... Uh, yeah, probably. What's the word for shear thickening? Thixotropic is shear thinning, right? I forget. I have to look it up. Uh, I used to know these at one time. I've forgotten now over the years. Uh, back in, like I said, back in the mid 19. Sorry? Your state is decreasing. No, the shear thickening, what's the term that is used for? Thixotropic and dilatant. Yes, dilatant uh, fluid. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and uh, people have modeled these in great detail, uh, CFD kinds of models of this capillary flow process, and uh, all the optimization over the years have been done because of studies like that. Okay. okay, so let's go back to where I went off on a tangent. Uh, okay, so, uh, and the last portion I missed out, forgot to mention, is the moisture aspect of it. When it absorbs moisture, not only are you vulnerable to corrosion and, uh, and uh, uh, changing of dielectric properties, what does moisture do to polymers? Makes it swell, right? So that's another expansion, your unwanted expansion. And I'll share with you an example in, uh, in uh, day five, which is part of the study. Krishna wasn't, uh, one of his batch mates did that part of the study, where moisture failed the solder joint because the moisture caused swelling of the material in the vertical direction. The solder does not absorb moisture or swell, so the solder did not expand. The underfill expanded in the vertical direction, and it eventually cracked solder joints. Um, we'll talk about that on the very last day. I'll give you an example. Okay? So bottom line, underfilling is a very sophisticated technology. The good news is it's been around for long enough that the Reputed manufacturers understand all of these issues, and they have pretty much cured most of these problems. Today, every flip chip is underfilled, and they survive reasonably well. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and and flip chip on board, which is a huge CT mismatch. So if you put this, make the substrate printed wiring board or any organic, like uh, organic substrate. Uh, BGAs have organic substrates, so the substrate itself is a printed wiring board in a BGA. Flip chipping on that is now dime a dozen. So we have the right underfills now available to do that. There's another very interesting phenomenon of underfills that help solder joint life, which I'll talk about on day five, because I'll take up another half an hour if I want to talk about that. But the point is, you can see that we've done a lot of work with underfills, so it's near and dear to my passion, because there are a lot of subtleties we had to deal with over the years, so I could talk forever about it. Okay. Uh, so uh, this part is the, I mentioned that there's underbump metallization, also called uh, uh, BLM, ball limiting metallization. It's basically designed to A, limit the bump to the region of the die, sorry, on that side, on the die that you want. You don't want it spreading o over other regions of the die. You want to limit it into the opening that you've made in the passivation layer. 
So to do that, you put down, that's one of the reasons you pull that, uh, 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 put that metallization down. So the solder forms by wetting just that metallization. The bump forms by wetting the metallization. And the two other reasons, as I said, one is to promote adhesion, uh, and the other is to uh, uh, prevent, as a barrier layer, to prevent diffusion of the solder metal into the bond pad and beyond. Okay. Okay. So the metallization is also very important, and that's also come a long way. Okay. Uh, so uh, the bumping process. Again, there are a bunch of different methods. The first three are the most common ones. These are not that common. Okay. So evaporation method, electroplating method, or stencil printing method are the most common methods of putting down these solder bumps. And then, then you have to uh, reflow them once for the solder paste to become actually a solder ball. Okay? And then, of course, it remelts again when you uh, join them to the substrate. Uh, so here is the other. So I've, so far, I've talked about the capillary uh, flow underfill okay? called CFU. Uh, there are several other techniques, um, uh, mold underfill, and most important, no flow underfill. That's also very common, so we'll talk about that. Uh, the, the wafer applied underfill is basically one of these techniques. Uh, sorry, not the capillary. It's a no flow underfill, uh, but applied at the wafer level as opposed to single chip level. Okay. Okay. Uh, so post applied underfill means basically after you have uh, bonded the clip chip onto the substrate, it's gone through reflow, solder has bonded, then you do the underfilling, that's post applied underfill. So that is the capillary flow underfill I was talking about all this time. Molded underfill is that same flow, but instead of relying on capillary force for the underfill to penetrate, because remember, you can only apply that once it's bonded, let's go to this picture, once it's bonded, I can only apply the underfill here, I cannot directly apply it inside. I can apply it to the side and by capillary flow, it has to infiltrate everywhere under the uh, die. So that's the problem over there. Uh, and it's a batch process. It's a slow process, batch process, cannot do high throughput, all of those issues. Molded underfill actually uses a molding process, just like injection molding, transfer molding. So it, now it's filled in under high pressure, so it's a faster, more reliable process. It's a vacuum-assisted process. Uh, the pre-applied is a totally different technology. Before you put the die down, you first put down the layer of underfill, okay? And then you put the die down. You have to kind of push it into place because otherwise you have to remove the underfill so that the solder joint makes contact to the uh, bump on the, uh, the bond pad on the substrate. So uh, it changed <laughs> just in time, okay? So I do need to go back to this, yeah. Uh, so, no, not that picture here. So what you would do is you would first put down the underfill, then you would put the device down and you'd have to press down so that the solder is now actually making contact here without a layer of underfill in between. Okay? Uh, that's a technology that actually got developed in Georgia Tech, C.P. Wong. Now, of course, a lot of people use it, and a lot of research has been done on it by a lot of people since then, but he was one of the early people who proposed the no-flow underfill. Uh, so, uh, and now what's happening is you're pre-applying it, so you're not dependent, relying on any capillary flow, nothing. You're putting a blob of underfill over that entire footprint of the die and then putting the die down. So there's no lateral flow that is needed. That's why it's called a no-flow underfill. Okay? Uh, and you can do that, again, as I said, individual die level, or you can do it on the wafer itself. So you can put the underfill onto the die side and then take the die with underfill on it and put it onto the substrate after singulation. Yes, so, uh, some, some uh, technologies use it on a production basis. So that the pr that, uh, not really underfill, so it should be having like uh, holes everywhere, right? So that like, like your solder work can just take No, 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 no. It's just, uh, it's uh, by rheology. It's, it's just a liquid, liquid meaning it's a pasty, uh, viscous uh, polymer uh, melt. Like yeah, uh, like solder paste, and uh, you basically have to buy mechanical force displace the, uh, 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 the polymer so that the bump makes contact with the pad. Okay. Okay. Um, this is the picture that shows, oh, this shows capillary underfill. Okay. So here you first do the bonding. Okay. So you've done the reflow, form the bond, and then you, are, you clean it, right? You try to remove the flux as much as possible, and then you disp uh, dispense the underfill from one side, and by capillary flow, it fills the entire region, and then you have to cure that underfill 
So you do another heating cycle to cure that other flow. OK. This is a cross-section picture I sh shared with you already. This is the solder ball. This is the chip. Substrate is somewhere way down beyond this picture. And this is the filled polymer, the underfill, which is a filled polymer. Okay. Uh, here's the no-flow underfill. Okay. This is the general concept. You dispense the underfill first. Then you put down the component, you press down on it so the bump can make contact with the pad. That means it physically displaces the uh, underfill that's on top of the pad. And then you s reflow and cure the underfill all in one shot. So it's a single cycle. Here there are two. When you're doing it, like there mm -hmm. might be some, uh, there's a chance that the underfill might be yes. like, get stuck between. Yes. The so the it's a source of defects. So uh, it has a higher risk because of that. But it's a batch process. It's a faster throughput process. So people have, over time, learned to manage the quality issue, yield issue. And uh, uh, I, yeah, I don't know if they use some thermos, uh, ultrasonic energy when placing it. Do you know? I, d I don't know for sure. I mean, uh, I know they apply compression, but whether they apply any vibration energy to move the, yeah, move the underfill, I don't know. Uh, so uh, yeah, but, the, uh, but the, uh, the second key issue is you pick in place and uh, into place, and then that's it. Uh, well, and then make sure it's making good contact, and then just one reflow, uh, that's one source of a cycle of heat, uh, does the soldering. That solder uh, melts and bonds to the pad and underflow cures, as opposed to here, one heating cycle to solder, another heating cycle to cure, and uh, no flow, everything is happening in one shot. OK? Uh, yes, so there are such things as no clean fluxes, and that's what gets used in this case. Uh, but yeah, you're leaving behind some residues. Yeah. These are very low, re no clean fluxes are very low residues, but there's still some amount of residue that gets left behind. Ah, uh, over here uh, for flip chip, you mean? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so this is just a head to head comparison of the steps in capillary underflow versus the steps in uh, no flow. And you can see there are less number of steps, less of a batch. This step is a slow batch mode process. That, whole, that, f uh, that filling is a batch mode process. That whole thing is eliminated. So now there's much higher throughput for assembly line process. Uh, but again, it's not a foolproof method. It's, it's, it's got uh, fluxes trapped in there. It's got some amount of potentially some amount of uh, underflow, uh, underfill may get trapped at the interface. So all of those are issues. The biggest issue why it took time to get popular is uh, if you have a defective die, you're not going to know it until after you've interconnected and then tested. This is not a reworkable underfill. So uh, you cannot, once you find, oh, that's a bad die, you cannot, remember. here you can desolder it, put in a good die, known good, uh, a better uh, die, test it. So that's why there's a test pro uh, step in here. You solder it, test it, and then you underfill it. Once you know you've got a known good die. Over here, you have some amount of yield issues because the die happened to be bad, and you did, there was no way to know it until after it was bonded. And the underfill is not reworkable, so you cannot take it apart anymore. So a lot of research got done on reworkable no-flow underfills, and now there are some reworkable. Well, the manufacturer claims reworkable no-flow underfill, but they're not perfect. There are some issues with them. OK. All right, so this is the molded one. OK, so here it's uh, under pressure and vacuum. You're uh, doing molding, so there are molding cases. This is the molding die, and then there's a vent hole where you pull a vacuum, and then you uh, fill the underfill. So because of the vacuum, you get much better filling. So here, the mold compound is itself your underfill. Okay? So you need to choose your mold compound properties now correctly to have all the properties that we mentioned that an underfill needs to have. So uh, it, but again, it's a one-step process. Uh, well, not one step in the sense of uh, no-flow underfill, but one step in the sense of the mold case and the underfill are getting made in one step. Okay? But the soldering is still a separate step. Uh, so here you can see two levels. That's a flip chip solder joint inside the package. This is the package substrate. And then there's a ball grid joint outside the package. Those bo that ball grid set of joints will go onto your circuit card. 
In general, there's, there's a difference in size and pitch between the uh, uh, solder joint in the flip chip and the solder joint for ball grid array. Increasingly, though, people are starting to make ball grid arrays that are almost the same pitch as flip chip. So people are making finer and finer pitch ball grid arrays. Uh, sometimes there may be multiple uh, chips in here, so you'll get connections between chips before you come out to the substrate. So all of those are permutations, combinations. And then uh, there's some re, uh, redistribution layers on the, on the uh, substrate so that you can redistribute the signals from the flip chip joint to the corresponding ball grid joint. There's also, by the way, redistribution layers sometimes on the chip side, very complex, because these are multi-layer chips, a lot of active layers, so they are redistribution layers from the solder joints to the uh, transistors inside the chips. OK. Um, oh, this is just showing you uh, uh, the, the underfill being applied at the wafer level. OK, so here you apply the underfill right at the wafer level before you do the dicing. So the underfill is applied right here. The yellow underfill is applied right here. And then you do the dicing. Now each die is coming out with the underfill on it. And now you flip the whole thing over and bond to the substrate. Okay. So that's uh, definitely a higher throughput. OK, uh, what's next? Uh, one moment. Oh, molding, transfer molding. Uh, should we continue on? Uh, Yes? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm not going to, okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the transfer molding process. A, because that's not my area of expertise. B, uh, there's not a lot of reliability issues. Well, not the same extent of reliability issues here as the underfill had. It's not uh, performance characteristics are somewhat less demanding. But it's basically like any transfer molding process. You create two dies, create a cavity for the package. And then you do the underfilling, the gate design, the flow design are all critical, right? But that's in any molding process. It's uh, similar considerations. Uh, so uh, then after you've done the molding, you uh, take the mold apart, demold, and then you have to singulate, flash, remove all the flash, uh, all those steps, OK? Uh, all right, I'm going to skip these details. Uh, uh, that's just a picture of a transfer molding press. Uh, OK. Uh, so this is about gate design. So again, molding, gate design and molding is a, is a very important step. You have to design these so the flow is uniform from all sides uh, so that everything fills in properly and you're not, the, uh, it's not solidifying and curing in, uh, while it's traveling. It has to get to its final destination and then cure. Uh, so this is just showing what the flow process looks like. Uh, this is to remind you that the flow has to go past these wire bonds if it's wire bonded uh, component. And that's where the wire sweep becomes a problem. Excessive sweep on the wire is going to create excessive drag resistance. And that will fail the wire bonds. Okay. Uh, uh, various examples of mold designs. Okay. All right. So here are the kinds of defects that we can see in uh, encapsulation. So this part is important. So one is, of course, uh, wire sweep is not a defect. Wire sweep is uh, basically a risk. If you have excessive uh, wire arch, then, uh, then uh, the mold gets basically caught in that wire and <coughs> puts excessive stresses on the wire. Or the wire gets caught in the flow and uh, there's excessive stresses in the wire. Paddle shift. So that sometimes happens, again, because of forces, molding forces that are acting on this lead frame. The paddle sometimes shifts. Okay, So that has been seen. Voids, incomplete filling. So there are some very complex nooks and crannies that have to be filled. So uh, poor filling can cause voids. <coughs> Delaminations, if the adhesion to these faces is not good, uh, faces to the lead frame, faces to the die, uh, if those are not good, you'll get delaminations at those interfaces. Excessive filling force and filling pressure has been known to crack the passivation layer on the die. It's a very brittle material, silicon nitride, very brittle material. And uh, that can crack due to during the molding process. Uh, 
The metallization has been known to deform. Again, excessive molding pressure can deform the metallization. Uh, dyes can fracture from excessive molding pressure. So all of those are known risks. Missing component part, I don't know what that's referring to. Uh, lead frame buckling, again, distortion, uh, deformation, and buckling of the lead frame. Excessive molding pressure can cause uh, lateral deformations in buckling. Okay. Uh, the package can warp. Okay, what that is referring to is very large, thin packages uh, uh, because of asymmetries between the mold compound uh, shrinkage characteristics and the dye shrinkage characteristics. Now you have, let's go back here. Think about it if it's a very large dye and very thin mold compound, thin outline package, for example, a chip scale BGA, then what will happen is with a very large dye, the shrinkage properties in this direction for the dye and the mold compound are very different. As they shrink, it warps. So uh, that, that, that is a known problem. Large package, large IO packages come out warped from the mold process because of that, and that's a big problem. So you have to design them very carefully so they're somewhat symmetric about the neutral plane, bending neutral plane of the package, so that both sides are shrinking the same amount and not creating a resultant bend. Okay. Foreign inclusions, that's a uh, quality control issue. Uh, contaminants got in. Okay. Improper marking, we'll skip that. Uh, trim and form, we will talk about that later on. Uh, that is, operations that you have to do afterwards can sometimes crack open that uh, the package, okay? uh, the, the interface over here. So, uh, and, and, and sometimes damage the wire bonds because you're putting in excessive lateral forces here for trimming and cutting off those leads. Uh, those forces travel back in and either cause delaminations or sometimes cause failures of the wire bonds. I don't know if you would call that an encapsulation defect. I think that's more a defect during the trim and form. Okay, so here are some examples of the paddle tilting because of the mold forces, delaminations. These are all acoustic scans. Uh, delamination uh, due to poor adhesion. Okay, that's a lead frame component, clearly. Okay. Uh, and then there's a post cure. So after it's been molded, there's a post cure operation to get a final conversion, uh, the, the polymerization and conversion. Uh, so typically that is done, it's a batch process. It's done uh, at about 170 to 175 degrees C for two hours. So that's an extended process to complete the pol polymerization in the mold compound. Okay. All right. Uh, so this is, you can see a picture here. This is the molding that has been done. The lead frame is sticking out on both sides. So this is still in the ribbon, the lead. The packages are in the lead frame ribbon. And now you're going to singulate. You're going to cut off from here and singulate each of the packages. Okay. Sorry? Question? Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, then there's issues like uh, you do some, uh, not sandblasting, but you do blasting with uh, polymer beads uh, to uh, uh, create a smooth surface. So the mold compound that comes out is a little rough on the exterior surfaces, so they just do some smoothing surface finish. It's almost for cosmetic reasons. It helps to do all the markings, all the laser markings of the part ID, part name, part number. Uh, it uh, helps with that. Okay, uh, there's also deflashing. So there is flash left behind uh, after the molding process. There's flash left behind where the two mold halves had met, and that has to be removed. So there's a deflashing operation that's needed. <coughs> so that's uh, uh, the, so j basically you either do again it's kind of a sandblasting kind of process, except it's not sand. It's uh, plastic beads, and this I didn't know till I read this slide. This is a slide I borrowed from Professor Hahn, and I learned that they use uh, materials like cracked walnut shell, apricot pits. I did not know that. I knew they used plastic beads, but this is new to me. Okay, so but it's basically a mix of these plastic beads and all these hard materials, crushed shells, and so on, to to create a blasting medium. Okay. Uh, then there's also water jet processes. I can't see where, it's, where that's in this slide. It's probably one of the later slides. There's also a water jet process for uh, uh, flashing. Ah, here, water jet deflashers, high pressure water jet streams are used for deflashing. Okay. Then there are also solvent methods where you melt away the flash uh, or, or chemically remove the flash with solvents. Uh, 
All right, so now you've deflashed. The final step is you've got to bend, which is form, uh, well, trim, form, and plate the leads, okay? Uh, so uh, 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 for bare copper lead frames, you usually uh, trim and form first and you do post plating, but there are many other cases where you do pre plating, that means uh, a noble metal, okay, pre plate, and then do the uh, form and trim, or trim and form. So here's the kind of operation you need. It's a basically a die operation where one half of the die is holding the lead, the other half of the die is uh, uh, forming it, and you form it in various shapes. It's not a single step. You need multiple steps. So here's the first bend. Then you make the second bend. Uh, the second bend can be a J lead like this, or it could be a gulving lead going outwards. So uh, various kinds of uh, uh, forming operations. But it's usually a multi-step operation. Puts a lot of plastic deformation in the lead, so a lot of stresses. Okay? So those stresses can sometimes crack, uh, cr uh, crack that interface, cause delaminations. Sometimes it may leave behind <coughs> micro cracks in the die, it, uh, in the lead. It certainly leaves behind a lot of residual stress in the leads because you're plastically deforming it. So by definition, it leaves behind uh, uh, residual stresses. So for example, one of the consequences of that is when we see uh, fatigue failures of leads due to vibration loading. Uh, typically, they fail in those shoulders where all the residual stresses are localized. Okay. Okay. Uh, and again, for different, different, depending on what lead type you have, you would need multiple forming operations. This particular picture is for J leads, but you could have gulving leads and so on. Okay. This is just another rendition of the same thing. It's uh, bending jigs with tools, so clamping tool that holds the inner side, and then a bending tool that uh, bends the outer one, and then you would bend the <coughs> outer end in a second operation. Uh, and th this is where it's showing that you can cause damage like cracking stitch bonds or cracking the polymer, polymer metal interface there and so on. Okay. And final step is cleaning, uh, deionized water cleaning. I think I'll uh, skip that. Let's talk briefly about, oh, so there's some discussion of the mold compounds. Uh, so these are filled resins, just like the underfill. These are filled resins. Again, you're trying to control the CT. You're trying to control the moisture properties, control the thermal and dielectric properties, and you're trying to control the mechanical stiffness of this. So the mold compound has to have very specific set of properties. So these are tailored polymers. That means they have resins and specific kinds density of fillers in them. Also, they have to be able to flow through. Again, the rheology is important. It has to flow through the molding gates and runners. So you have to be careful what density of and types of fillers you're putting in. And then, of course, you finally read mold release agents to uh, demold. Uh, so uh, uh, the resin material basically has is, is the matrix. It holds all the fillers. And also, it protects the dye from abrasion from the fillers. And uh, also, it, they try to make them as hydrophobic as possible to keep the moisture away from the dye surface. But that's only partially successful. And also, it uh, controls the dielectric properties. Uh, the, here are some examples. So that's data. I'll skip over these. So these are Novlax uh, cross-linked epoxies. Uh, the filler materials are used, as we said, uh, a, cost, but also uh, control the CTE, control the thermal properties, control the shrinkage, I forgot to mention that, control moisture absorption, control moisture-induced swelling, control the rheology to, for the right flow, and also uh, improve the mechanical properties, stiffness and strength. So the filler materials have, uh, again, fairly multidimensional functionality. Here are the kinds of materials that get used. If you use silica, crystalline, alumina is extensively used, and then more expensive options like aluminum nitride, silicon carbide, those are more expensive options. Uh, and then there's some data on some of these. I'll skip over those. Those you can read later at you. So what's the properties of the thermal conductivity, CTs, et cetera. So here are some pictures of what these fillers look like. So here's fused silica fillers. These are non-regular, irregular shapes, whereas if you fuse them first, uh, sorry, ground fuse, so because of the grinding, these have odd shapes. But then if you uh, uh, fuse them into spherical shapes, then they take these uh, simple spherical shapes. You can see there's a d size distribution, some large spheres, some small spheres. So there's a size distribution in there. 
that actually helps. The size distribution helps with filling the crevices. The small ones fill the crevices between the small large particles, so it gives you a better packing density. Okay, so that, oh, and uh, then the filler percentage, here's some studies of how the, I mentioned already qualitatively <coughs> that uh, the filler controls a lot of properties. One of those is the CT, so as an example, I've put up someone else, this is not our study, it's from the literature, so as the filler percentage increases, you can see that the CT comes down. But also as the filler percentage increases, your flow characteristic degrade, they can't get through fine gates and fine runners. So you have to optimize. You cannot just keep on increasing filler percentage. Uh, and th this basically tells you low filler CT, uh, low filler content means higher CTE, okay? So the filler percentage is on that axis and the CTE is on this axis. Okay, um, and finally there are a few words in mold release agents, basically, Silicones that, that act as mold release agents, okay? And, uh, ah, so qualification criteria for mold compounds. So you, here are the, again, groups of properties that are important. Thermomechanical properties are important, so you run qualification tests to make sure that they're not generating excessive thermomechanical stresses. That will crack the dye, failure wire bonds, bend the lead, uh, bend the lead frame, et cetera. So there are qualification tests run to verify those kinds of uh, behaviors. The rheological properties are extremely important. Again, qualification, uh, uh, qualification tests are done on mold compound materials to make sure they have the right rheological properties. Uh, the hardening, the curing and hardening, that's extremely important, right? The bo uh, both during the flow as well as the post-cure. So, uh, uh, those properties are important, and uh, other miscellaneous characteristics have been put in here, the thermal properties, electrical properties, uh, what kinds of harsh chemicals it has, ionic contaminants it has, and then the flammability. So flammability is extremely important. Electronics do catch fire, and if the mold compound is flammable, that aggravates the problem. So trying to limit flammable compounds in the mold compound is extremely important. So, uh, and, and again, uh, ionic contaminants, Halides, bromides, and all are heavily limited. Chlorides, bromides are heavily limited. Otherwise, you get excessive corrosion. So good mold compounds have very limited halide contents. Okay. We can take a lunch break. Okay? Thank you. So that's pretty much miscellaneous uh, shotguns of information I had on the various steps. So before you leave, just as a summary, by way of summary, I'll put up that first chart one more time, just to remind you what all this information was. So basically what we did is uh, addressed bits and pieces of inf important information throughout that whole process, uh, except in wire bond we looked at also tab and flip chip and underfilling. Rest of the processes you can see here, we talked about die attach, we talked about the lead frame trim formation, uh, uh, sorry, uh, encapsulation, transfer molding. We talked a little bit about trimming, forming. At every stage, my goal was to talk more about what are the potential reliability hazards and what properties do the materials need to have to minimize those hazards. Okay? All right. Great. Thank you.